Hey, there's Carmine of Peace, even though I don't look like Carmine of Peace, I am Carmine of Peace. And uh, you're listening to Tom and Zeus on the Shout It Out Loud cast. So keep listening, keep rocking. The year is 1977. The artist, Rod Stewart, in the album, Footloose and Fancy Free. Welcome to episode 56 of the album review crew, where we're going to talk about Zeus's pick this month, and we're going to be joined by one of our good friends, the great author, James Campion. He will be with us shortly, but until then, Zeus, it's me and you right now to get the show started. And we're talking about Metallica, the band that's probably been featured more on this fucking show than any other band so far. And I'm talking about when I say show, shout it out loud, cast. Yeah. It's between okay. album review crew, between Dorm Damage Metallica concert reviews, that's Metallica right, baby. breaking news. That's review, right. You Metallica on how they're running their concerts versus kids. That's yeah. why. That's what happens. All right. That's All right. right. So uh yeah we did metallica's black album legendary album of course and we're gonna get fucking metallica tards bitching about everything i'm sure in this feedback section but tom we did the poll first how did that go yep so the four songs that we always pick uh for our arc polls so this time it was sad but true Enter Sandman, Wherever I May Roam, and The Unforgiven. Enter Sandman wins the poll. No big surprise there. 32% tight, though. Sad But True comes in at 30. Wherever I May Roam comes in at 24. And The Unforgiven at 14. Lots sad of... Sad But True at 30? Yeah. Sad But True. Just just barely lost to Enter Sandman. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yep. Uh, lots of feedback on this one. Casey, it's pronounced KC. I like that one. Really tough choices, but I really like sad but true. Our buddy Nige sends us a gif of James singing sad but true, of course. Bob Scott says, if I don't hear the first three ever again, I'll be okay. All right. Well, Bob, appreciate that, but that was not the poll. But thank you for sharing. Um, a bit too batty says, enter Sandman. And it might be because of when I heard it at a monster truck rally as a kid. Okay. Hey, you know, whatever gets you going is all that matters when it comes to that. And a lot of people had a lot of different things to say about this. Our buddy Nige again. Nige listens to bands like Dying Fetus, Decapitated Corpse. So when he hears like Metallica Black Album, this is to him like, this is probably... This is probably like listening to Rod Stewart to Nige. So when he hears real Rod Stewart, his friggin' head's going to explode. But he says, I have opinions on this album. And then he talks about uh, our buddy Don Jameson and Don's comments about the band 200 Stab Wounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And he That's says, not a parody, is it? No, no, no. And, and, and then I like, and then I like, he goes, I'm not sure if you guys have heard the new Gate Creeper album. Oh, yeah, I have it, I have it right here, Nige. I bet you Steve Wright is probably taking a photo of it and spinning it these right oh, now as we course. speak. I got the <laughs> swirled vinyl of Gate Creeper Deluxe. Or, or three monkey wolves, whatever the fuck <laughs> wolf people that he listens to because Power of the album. Wolf. Power Wolf. He buys albums by the art. <laughs> Our buddy Greg Seacrest. Some good songs, but they really sold out on this album. Nothing Else Matters has me asking, is this Metallica or Steelheart? Ooh. They got, a t- <laughs> they got a ton of new fans, but alienated the OG fans like me who didn't want simplistic MTV friendly songs. Still, it's their fifth best album. All right, Greg, I get that. I, I-, I respect those Steelheart. comments. I respect those comments, but you can still listen to master of puppets and the black album it, it you can do both um but that's okay but that's what we got for twitter this time for metallica tards all right tom over on our book of face kevon japson oh. giggity, 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 giggity. 
I bought this the day it came out. It wasn't shocking at all to me. I was hunkered down playing guitar all day. So going from trying to play 7 billion notes on Justice to this was easier and more accessible. Yep. I learned every note on this one. Yeah, Tom. I love Struggle Within. All right. Probably my favorite solo to play. The last three songs are probably my favorites. The least favorite is Through the Never Ever oh. Ending Song. That's just me <laughs> ad-libbing. Great analysis, guys. Way cool hearing Don's perspective. And that's why we have the third man in. We think it brings yep. a fresh... Uh, perspective on a lot of these stuff, and we don't know where these people are going to land. So that's right. Yep. Uh, the great Paul Hyder. Yes, I'm an 80s Metallica fan, but I've never hated this album. Always thought it was a great album in beginning to end. It's their objectively best songwriting album. Oh, yeah. Mark the peak of their career, much like Lep's Hysteria, another band that never came close to that magical creative time again. I'll always love their earlier stuff more and get very lukewarm on what comes on afterwards that said it's still uh thrilled that metallica is absolutely ruling the rock world after all these years no one would have predicted that back in the 80s that's a great comment that is a great comment great love comment. it yep lee graham says great episode guys seem only yesterday when the cd hit my desk and i penned the attached review yeah, i guess he wrote a review i'm the opposite of zeus underground fan since hearing the demo pride to kill them all as for black i've grown to appreciate it much more over the years it's great to hear buddy uh bobby kenner says every now and then an album comes out and you hear it for the first time and you're like holy shit just look around in amazement. This was one of those times. Same for me as Kiss Alive. The first time hearing it. The Black album wasn't still giant among albums if you love hard rock and metal. Nice. Let's go over to Loudcasters, Tom. Okay. <laughs> uh, hey. Michael, <laughs> Michael Murphy. Undeniable classic hard rock metal album. I think the band lost its way for a while after this. But anybody who thinks this is a bad arm that Metallica got sold out can go fuck their mother. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Okay. I guess we're getting aggressive now. <laughs> Holy yeah, go now. fuck your mother. <laughs> <laughs> what are you still doing there? I thought I told you to go fuck your mother. <laughs> Uh, holier than thou, my friend Misery through the never are standouts for me. Great pick, and I hope this makes up for my terrible take on Journey's Escape. Really looking forward to next month when you guys review Zeus's pick, Slave to the Scapel <laughs> by 200 Stab Wounds. I am swearing these are fucking parodies. No, that's but real. I'm assuming these are rare. Well, are 200 real. Stab Wounds is a real band. Unfortunately. Oh, oh my god. I'm going to read this one. Brad Marks. Mama said, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything. I'm not saying anything about this album. Blows. <laughs> Great review <laughs> and episode, though. Actually, Nothing Else Matters is a brilliant song. Burnout Factor, high, but a great song nonetheless. Got to hand it to you. At least they said it. Okay. Well, fair enough. Everybody's got opinions. All right. Uh, God bless you, Joey Bicep Curl Romanic. But you wrote a fucking War and Peace comment. It looks great. Uh, I suggest people go read it, but there's a lot there. Same thing with Adam Nirenberg. Same thing with Thanos Akratides. We'll be here all fucking day if we start reading this. But there's way too many comments here from everybody. I'll read this last one here on Loudcast. It's Daniel Haller Houston. I admit, I was a weird gatekeeping Metallica fan. I remember being so disappointed that I had no fast songs and two ballads. I've mm -hmm. lightened up over the years. If they were going to stick with that skate thrash crowd they would have probably not have made it for 40 years mm -hmm. great episode not my favorite record but i agree there's good stuff on it okay you know where they would be they would be megadeth anthrax that's right slayer they'd be in that region you know right. decent no different than rat they'd be opening uh, up for shitty bands like five finger death punch in front of the, in yeah, front of the reverse or um I, I don't know poison at this point you know still have an audience still can yeah, the Poor, but yep. they're not playing stadiums if they didn't sell out, right? That's right. Hey, that's right. Yep. You know exactly where they'd be. So let's go over to YouTube, uh, Tom, and uh, <laughs> uh, Ken Woodbury, 7299, says, love Tom's reference to Rand McNally. 
at the beginning of the show. <laughs> Fucking hilarious. <laughs> made me crack up. Help me out, buddy. What, what was he talking uh, we, about? I don't know what we were talking about, but I made something. Somebody was talking. We must have been talking about direct. Oh, oh, I know what it was. We were talking about don't stop believing in how there's no South Detroit and East oh, yeah. and West. Like, oh, fucking sorry, Rand McNally. We don't have a fucking map of Detroit. <laughs> Who the fuck is Rand McNally? You don't know Rand McNally. They make maps. I, Glo- they make globes. They make I maps. No idea. Oh, really? So you don't know that? I, I thought you knew what Rand McNally a, is. I thought it was a person or a song. <laughs> like, no, it's like a, no, they, they make like globes and maps. What do they use? <laughs> fucking Magellan. No <laughs> maps and shit. I can gel it. What do you say? I like the Soto. Found in the Mississippi. Mississippi. Oh, oh yeah. like they oh, wouldn't, wouldn't have found that. <laughs> Great Seinfeld thought. Yeah. All right. I'm going to read this one from your buddy, Nige, because he had to write it here. Oh, I, wait. He's my buddy now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> he, he's into fucking, fucking aborted fetus tabs. <laughs> Whatever the fuck he's listening to. Uh, such a great episode. As you know, I'm old school thrash guy back in the day. I was one of those fans who's pretty disappointed in the Black Album when he came out. For me, the first four albums are ab- absolutely untouchable. But just like Don said, I wasn't pissed about it. Totally fair enough that they want to expand their sound. Also, I'm not one of those fans who say everything they've done since Injustice at All is total crap. That is clearly a ridiculous statement. For example, I think the yes. latest one, 72 Seasons, is fucking fantastic. It Best is. Best thing they've done since the 80s. Yep. But regardless, even after 30 years, yes, the Black Album sounds amazing, thanks to Bob Rock. Mm-hmm. But for me, the songs just aren't theirs. It has a few legendary songs, of course. I'm with Dawn for me. Sad But True is the best song on here. A Stone Cold classic that absolutely crushes live. But overall, for me, the album's just okay. I think it all depends when you got on the elevator, as Paul would say. In 1985, Ride the Lightning was my entry point. Not only to Metallica, but into metal overall. But if your entry point was the Black Album, I could totally understand why it would be mind-blown as the first four albums are to me. And mm-hmm. for that, I'm off listening to 200 Stab Wounds album, which fucking rules. Much love as always, gents. I'll tell you right now, that band should be paying us royalties. We've said their name in the last five minutes more than probably anybody has ever said their name in the history of the band. <laughs> Stab Wounds? Come on, that's a fucking joke, right? That's not it's real. Not. No, that's a real band. That's a real band. As 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 Jamie Foxx would say, come on, Whitney, you ain't that high. You ain't, you that, ain't high. that high. You ain't she that high. She said, <laughs> Bobby Brown was the king of R&B. <laughs> Shit. Rocks and blunts, <laughs> ribs and barbecue. You ain't the king of R and B. Yeah, it had an album out since eighty two. <laughs> That's one of the greatest comedy specials of all. Time. It's absolutely classic. <laughs> yep, it does smell like shit, doesn't it? But the <laughs> fuck, it's, it's, it's you. you. Yeah, and if you want to hear more of this, go listen to our Dorm Damage episode. We talk about our stand up comedy oh, shit. Jimmy Fox, Tom, I'm going back to you, buddy. All right, let's go through a couple of things on Instagram. Whacked Show says a year and a half in the life of documentary covering the recording of the tour of this album is fantastic. Play the hell out of those VHS tapes in high school. Yes, it's on DVD, too. It's friggin' awesome. If you like behind the scenes documentaries, it's excellent. Murph chimes in with a good one here. Fifth best album that came out during that 45 day stretch. Now, oh. for those that don't know what Murph is talking about. In 1991, within a 45-day stretch, you had the following albums released. Okay? Talk about the golden era of music. Okay? You had Metallica Black Album, Pearl Jam 10, Guns N' Roses Use Your Illusion 1 and 2, Red Hot Chili Peppers Blood Sugar Sex Magic, Soundgarden Bad Motorfinger, and Nirvana Nevermind were all released within 45 days of each other. So that's pretty fucking insane. Uh, Let's look at a few emails here. Our buddy Mike H., my relationship with Metallica is tenuous. I saw them live on the Justice Tour, and during the show, they did a little thing where James would call out a famous drummer, and Lars would then play a famous beat from said drummer. If I recall correctly, James was sitting at a kit also. Anyways, James calls out Peter Chris, and Lars just held up his arms and crossed his sticks like Peter did on the Alive cover, and James laughed. I took it as it was meant, an insult. I've never been able to fully embrace Metallica because of this. It's like trying to be friends with a guy who beats your sister. I have similar issues with Chris Cornell due to the same reasons. Mike H., I respect your story. You're going way out of your way there with some analogies and some personal issues with the band, but that's okay. 
Our buddy Craig Moran, what's up, guys? Black Album. I was already a fan when Jethro Tull stole their Grammy, but this was the first Metallica album I got on release day, the first time I got to see them in concert. The beginning of possibly the best two months in rock releases ever. Then he goes and kind of runs off the albums I just talked about. There were some hot takes on this episode for sure. Zeus having Don't Tread on Me as his number two blew my mind. It's definitely a number two for me, but that's because it's crap. <laughs> to, to me, it's a plodding redneck rant. And his and his taking of load and reload over any three Metallica albums definitely made me choke. But not everyone likes thrash, so I can certainly understand and respect that view. Half of the album has been way overplayed. So while I love it, it's not a go-to. It's amazing to think that Sandman was actually the show opener when this tour started. And three years later, when the tour ended, it was in the encore. Good stuff, Craig. Appreciate it. One more email here. Now, this one comes from... The Metal Oasis email, that's our buddies Adam Stevenson and his co-host Orion. Yes, his co-host name is named after a Metallica instrumental. I'm just kidding. I don't know if that's true, but his name really is Orion. And Orion is emailing us here because he's a big Metallica guy too. I just finished the review for this classic album and I thought I would share my thoughts on some of your rankings. The God That Failed Dead Last, Blasphemy. That bass line, the crunchy stomp and lyrical content, and Kirk's solo are absolutely a chef's kiss. It's the best song on the album. Woo! Of Wolf and Man at number eight, how much more wrong could you be? Another haunting riff that chugs and builds up, bringing the imagery of a true metamorphosis of a man becoming a wolf. And the struggle within it, three? While I appreciate and commend your thought process of listening to albums on shuffle so that the back half of albums don't get the fatigue treatment, this song is just plain two thumbs down. Ooh, damn. Lastly, the Unforgiven and Nothing Else Matters may be overplayed, but hearing those with 80,000 people was a religious experience. I agree with that, yes. While Justice is their best effort to date, the Black Album pushed the band to heights, and without it, I don't think they'd be at the level where they are today. Good review, boys. Can't wait to see what more metal albums come down the pipe. Well, Ryan, thank you. Nice to hear from you, my friend. And... Good stuff as always. Check those guys out. The Metal Oasis podcast. They're talking about all kinds of stuff. Uh, Two hundred stab wounds is probably the next episode. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you keep doing. You keep doing. You're bitching about it, but you keep bringing them up because it's funny. Because it's funny, and that's what we got for feedback there, Zeus. All right. One thing I want to ask before we turn the page on Metallica. Yeah, I, I just heard him say, and it doesn't match Injustice for All. So I- I've heard all sorts of shit. I'm curious. Is it just yeah. me? Yeah. As an outsider, just hearing the Metallica crap all around me all the time. Yeah. I've always put like the black gets commercial love, but not love by all Metallica fans. But that the biggest album and the most universally loved, if they're any gonna but put any album, it's either Master of Puppets or the Black, wherever you fall. I don't hear anybody say Ride the Lightning's the best album. I never hear anybody say Kill Them All. But no. then again, I'll get some people I hear that Injustice for All yep. might be. I yep. never hear anything after the Black Album as being their best album. Oh, ever. no. No, you won't. So, uh, so I'm curious. Where do you think is the most popular? I know, like, don't go album sales. But for Metallica fans, am I correct to say probably Master of Puppets? Because yes. even the Black Album people love that. Whereas yes, pu- the but- Master of Puppets people might not like the Black Album. I think Puppets checks off a couple of different boxes because it's probably their arg- arguably their best album. And it's their it's thrashy. It's heavy. I mean, we reviewed it. We loved it. But even people that aren't Metallica fans like, you know, Welcome Home Sanitarium or they like Master of Puppets. Like I They do. like that. Yeah. Whereas Ride the Light. I mean, Ride the Lightning. Don't get me wrong. It has For Whom the Bell Tolls, Fade to Black. Like those are classic staples, slower songs. You don't have to be a thrash fan. To me. Justice for All is right there with puppets, but Justice for All is that's not a very accessible album besides the song one. And one it reminds me of the shit that Black used to uh, get, like too commercial, too this. They did yeah. a video for it, so yeah, it doesn't that, have that street cred. Right, right. And then I don't hear anybody really going like mentioning a lot of songs from and Justice for All as like no. top five Metallica songs. Not really. You won't really. In, as maybe maybe Terran battery and maybe maybe you might have people talk about blackened that's the the type the yeah. opening track off of justice but yeah because every song on the album is like fucking eight minutes long yeah which is, and which is why i love thing, it but which is why i like the black album afterwards because there are songs yes not fucking 
Epics. operatic fucking yep. interludes that go on for nine minutes. Yep. So, yep. All right. And yep. so I just had to ask you about that. No, that's no fair. Yep. Okay. All right, we're back from our break with our good friend and author, the great James Campion, author of Shout It Out Loud, The Story of Kisses Destroyer. Take a sad song, a great Beatles book about Hey Jude. He's written books about Warren Zevon, and he's in the middle of putting together a book about one of my all-time favorite artists, the great Prince. And we're also so lucky to have him be a contributor to our book, Raise Your Glasses. James, welcome back to the show, buddy. How are you? Very good to see both of you gentlemen. I was a proud guest of your show, I think early 2022. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the shout it out loud anyway. And this is the first time I'm doing this, so I'm very excited. And I just want to say publicly what I told you guys before we ran. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. From someone like myself, I, I know how hard it is to do what you guys do, did. And th- I'm very excited to see it and read it. And congrats to both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, that may, coming from an author like you, we appreciate that so much. Thank you. Really awesome. Tom, on the intros, you should have just said, uh, now we have James Campion contributed to shout it out. Uh, <laughs> I even screwed up the book, our book name. <laughs> contributed to raise your glasses. Yep. Wow. And, then, and, and that's it. And you'd be like, that's all he needs. That's what he's famous that's, for. So. That's, that's right. That, yes. That's right. That's going to be that. He's going to, he's updating his website as we speak. <laughs> that's, that's I'm reti- I could retire happy now. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Why not? Why not? So I, James has been beyond helpful behind the scenes. I've, I've picked his brain a million times over since we started this book. And uh, I remember where I was, I was driving to a field hockey tournament, I think for my daughter driving somewhere. And I, asked him and we were talking about music and I know you love the stones. And I was like, you know what? I was thinking about picking this Rod Stewart out Rod Stewart album for a while. Tom. And I'm like, you know what? That's going to be a tricky guest. Who am I getting? And I was like, Oh shit. If I do that, I bet you James, you, you like Rod Stewart. And you're like, yeah, I like Rod Stewart. Do you know this album? He's like, yeah, I I know that album. I'm like, great. If we ever do this, I'm going to call you. And he's like, okay. And then I, I was like, you know what? Let's mix it up, Tom. We've we've been all over the map. We're yep. going from oh, yeah. Metallica's Black album to a '70s Rod Stewart album. <laughs> yep. And uh, I, I, you know, just because we just love James, anyways, I'm like, he's the perfect guest for this. So that's hence why he's here, and he yep. was kind enough to join us. But what we usually do, James, first is we talk about the album, how we got into it, uh, where it came from, and our and why we picked it. So for me. Everybody grew up with Rod Stewart. So we were like everybody else in the, the MTV era. But he is one of the few like 70 stars that transitioned into the MTV era mm-hmm. and it worked. So he was everywhere. So I got into him. I didn't know any of his really 70s material, but I did know uh, Young Turks back mm-hmm. then, the early MTV days. Uh, tonight, you're, tonight, I'm yours, whatever it is. Um, and other videos that were popping up on MTV constantly, baby Jane and things like that. And so I always loved the voice to me. He and uh, Tanya Tucker, um, oh, Bonnie Tyler. I love that raspy voice. And to, and I think either you love it or it grates on you and it's not your thing. But I love Rod Stewart's voice, so I can have him sing the phone book and I'd be okay. In addition to this, Hot Legs has always been one of my favorite fucking songs. And when I saw that video, you know, over <laughs> the last few years and stuff. and Don't, don't comment too much on the video yet. No, no, okay. no. Okay, because but it's that's, one a whole, of those, that's a whole episode. I think that video could be a breakdown, could be a whole episode yes. between that and, um, and the Stones is... Um, uh, start me up. Start video. me up. Oh, you can have a battle of which is the most cocaine filled video you've ever seen in your life when <laughs> the most and break it down like the Zapruda film of the most hilarious, stupid clips. Yep. So I love hot legs. And then, you know, sometime in the uh, years ago, I I'm like, you know what? I love hot legs. Oh, my God. Uh, 
what do you call it there? Uh, now I'm dropped. I'm forgetting. I'm going blank. Um, You're in my heart is another classic that I knew. And like, I'm like, oh, that's two good songs. I'm sure I like the rest of the album. So I bought it. Mm-hmm. And it's just been on my rotation ever since. I, I love the album. I, I, I will make a few bold statements. Uh, one of them will be that to me, the Rod Stewart band as it exists for this album is the stones with a better singer. As fucking oh, wow. good as we're, com- that we're, we're coming out of the gate with really hot takes. <laughs> I think this band is incredible. Um, I, 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 three guitarists, a kick ass bassist, Carmine kills it. They had a few great albums. Rod Stewart in the 70s to me, that that discography is phenomenal, phenomenal. And uh, he's just somebody that's over lasted over the years. And either you really love him or he just, he's not your thing. And it reminds me a lot of the guy that you like, Tom, and that's Elton John. Mm-hmm. You just, it, he just works for you. Mm-hmm. And his 70s catalog probably. Untouchable. Although you, yeah, and you might like some of the stuff in the 80s, but his 70s stuff, you mm-hmm. love it. And yep. it works. And the same thing here. I find the musicianship incredible. And then you just throw in his voice. Mm -hmm. So this album, I play it all the time. I go to certain songs on this, but I'll play the whole album through and I don't have an issue with it. And I fell in love with it. And I thought it was something different for us to listen to. Oh, I agree. Some of our metal heads to actually expand, open up their mind, Tom, and see how that works. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, um, I'm handing it over to you guys. James, why don't you go next? About uh, Rod Stewart in general, and I guess this album specifically, kind of, you know, where you land on this. Yeah, so it's not quite where uh, Zeus was, was landing there. About no, the I know, Stones, I know. But but, uh, but I will say this, though. There's a couple of things. Now, Rod Stewart's early 70s work, up until this record, is, I wouldn't say it's in the Elton John you know, category. I mean, Elton John's run from 1970 to 76 is as good as the Beatles. And I've said that that's that's my hot take. By the I way, that, I, but by the way, and I don't mean to interrupt you, James, you need to do an Elton John book. That's going to be next, that's good. That's going to be a next project. Please go ahead. <laughs> We're giving that's you fun. work to do. Yes. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I, I I tried to reach out to Bernie Toppin years ago uh, yep. and I had befriended Rob Thomas from Matchbox 20 and he had done some work with him. And he's like, mm, you know, Bernie is kind of a born again Christian. Now. He doesn't like to talk about those songs anymore. It kind of turned oh. me off. Of that. I really wanted to to interview him and talk about the old because that's you know, he he's one of the guys that made me want to be a writer. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so Rod Stewart, that run that Rod Stewart had in the early 70s up into this record. And this is why this is very interesting. You guys picked this record and then I'm on to talk about it because from a music writer standpoint, I could tell you that this is probably the last, this is the demarcation album between Rod Stewart's bluesy, woozy, rock and boozy, rock and roll stuff that he did with the faces and Ron Wood Mm -hmm. from 69 to about 75. And then this record is sort of like just the precursor to his do you think I'm sexy? Yes. Uh, late seventies disco. And then into what Zeus said before about the eighties thing, uh, and, and complete with a couple of videos. And we'll talk about that as you guys said, but yes, from 1969 to 1974, when they broke up, Ron Wood and Rod Stewart were attached at the hip. They were the Lennon McCartney, Jagger Richards of that period. And yep. right around that time, they broke off. And of course, Ron Wood went on to join the stones and Rod Stewart, who was doing a parallel solo career along with the faces where they put out like seven albums in four years. It's insane. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's insane. And they all played on each other's records, very incestuous uh, musically. And so um, this album, the sounds on the album, the ballads on the album, and a lot of the lyrics really do speak to where Rod was at this time. So I think it's fascinating that you guys picked this record because it's not his best record, but I think it's his last really great record. Uh, of the 70s and i'd put it somewhere in the middle of that but but yeah i I think it's a fascinating timepiece of a career that has spanned what 50 years now i mean the guy sang on demos in the 60s he put for immediate records he sang he he was in jeff beck's group in the late 60s early 70s the fade the faces a solo career what an amazing and now he's doing vegas and i mean and so this is right smack in the middle of that thing you know and and i and i'd say it again it's a transition record for him yeah. 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 For me, so for Rod Stewart, I, I'll be honest with you, right out of the gate, I've never owned a Rod Stewart album in my life. 
Um, I, I, I know, I mean, you, we're music fans. You, he's unavoidable. Yeah. Obviously his hits, as Zeus said, whether they're classic rock hits or the MTV hits. So I knew hot legs. How could you not know hot legs? Um, I've always been a fan of him. Uh, Zeus, like you, I love his raspy style. I mean, I I know that's why one of the reasons why you love Peter Chris, that raspy vocal style is what we love. Whiskey soaked. Yeah. And I love, I love the, I love the faces. I love this era of the stones, the the early seventies, mid seventies stones. Like you said, James, that bluesy, just real, like sleazy, like bluesy rock, just really riffs and stuff. Yeah. yeah, Great riffs. Like it sounds like everybody's like half shit faced, having a good time recording the music and performing. I love it. And it's funny because I didn't, I knew about this album, but again, I never owned it. and I didn't know too much about it. So Anytime we do these episodes, I always kind of like like to research. And one thing I was really, really surprised because I don't have any kind of measuring stick for a Rod Stewart album like you do, James. Like, I don't know that this is this kind of Rod Stewart album compared to this one. I was shocked. Critics don't like this album. They don't like this album at right. all. Like this, a lot of the critic reviews I read, this album gets pummeled. Yeah, like, he was really bad. Yeah, though, this is a part of Rod Stewart's career. Uh, sorry, Tom, to jump in, but it's no, true. You, please. You hit upon something very important. First of all, Rod Stewart's finest album is Every Picture Tells a Story. There's not a bad song on that record. It's yep. a masterpiece. You should listen yep. to it. It's right up there with any great Elton John album we were talking about, Stones album. Uh, but this was a period in which Stewart had lost his way. People okay. were very tough on him anyway. They thought he was just too much of a prima donna. He was tough with interviews. They felt the faces sort of stayed together. He got a lot of blame for that breakup. I mean, this was a period where Stewart was really getting pummeled for being too poppy, too yep. mailing it in. And and I just think it's one of those things, and I've talked about this a million times since I uh I you know had the 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 Hey Jude book come out. Mm-hmm. is that the album by Paul McCartney called Ram that came out mm-hmm. in the early 70s, I think is his finest record, and it's my second favorite Beatles solo album of all time. And that's really been, been embraced by a lot of people now. Okay. But back then, it was lambasted. So when I got turned on to the record in the early 80s and the record had been out 10 years, I'm like, what am I missing? Yeah. But But just like you said, review after review after review, no matter what magazine, no matter what, it's like gets yep. hammered in. Yep. I mean, you you listen to it, Tom, and I know Zeus likes it. I, I, that's crazy that you would hammer a record that is this, you know, diverse and has a lot of stuff. And you might not like the style or anything like that. That's subjective. But I was, yeah, I, I, I was sh- I, yeah, I was shot. I mean, we'll we'll get into what we think of it when we do the tracks and stuff. But I mean, musicianship alone, like Zeus. I mean, how do you, how do you you don't have to like this record, but you have to be like, damn, this record like sounds good. Like there's something going on here on this record for sure. And yes. you know, I, I, and again, and I and I love the fact that Zeus picked it. I love when we do albums that I don't know very well, or in a case like this, I don't know at all. So I, I went into this just clear headed, you know, open eyes, open mind. And and I just kind of let my, and, and at Zeus, you'll get a kick out of this. Mm-hmm. This there's only been a few ARC episodes. This has passed the, I'm going to get the vinyl test. <laughs> I bought this. This came out. It's, it was reissued. Rhino records did a sounds of the summer. They did. They reissued a ton of things. This is issued on C blue vinyl remastered oh, and reissued. So it's, it's oh yeah. So you want to listen to something blue? You just put that on. Cause you know, colored vinyl sounds the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I have the old fashioned black original version of it. Tell you how old I am. So. Yeah. There you go. There you go. It's all good. It's all good. Yep. Yeah. There's certain albums. We've talked about this before that I've picked because I like a certain song. So I took rainbows. Last album that we did for them, uh, not down to earth, difficult to cure. And it's because they had a couple songs on there that are some of my favorite songs. So the album might be a little uneven, but I want to discuss those songs. I want to get that on this. I love the album straight through, but there are a couple songs that I, I have to mm-hmm. put that in the conversation and just talk about. But yep. for me, I, I hear where you're coming from, James, because everything really changed the next album because he puts out, Do You Think I'm Sexy? Now, He's going to do the Paul Stanley, yeah, F.U., number one hit, sold millions and millions of dollars. Still, the crowd goes crazy when I perform it every night. So F.U. to all you critics that bitch that I sold out. Stones had it with, uh, what do you call it? Miss, uh, Miss, Miss You, you. Right? Yep. Miss yeah. you. Yep. 
And, and the kiss did it with "I was uh, made for loving you." Everybody did it. Yeah, if they all Carmine did it. Carmine said Every- it to us when Carmine was on. He's like, "I got my name on that song. I wrote that with him. You know how much money he makes just from that song. He doesn't yep. give a shit that it's disco." <laughs> Carmine yep. played heavy metal music for years now, and he wrote, "Do you think I'm sexy?" Like, yep. It's okay. It's all right. But there is a big difference because he starts transitioning slowly. But to me, this band can't, I can't talk about it. So you got basically Rod on guitar, uh, Rod on vocals. You got Gary Granger who wrote a lot of the songs with he did. Yeah, he did. You got Jim Cregan who blows me away. And one of the souls we'll talk about and a guy named Billy Peck, three guitars. And the joke was, damn, you need three guitars to, to make up for Ron Wood, huh? And that's, I don't and, imagine and, that. And, and that's what he that's what he said. He goes, No, I just like he wanted a heavy sound with three guitars in his band. So he put that together. And then he's got Phil Chen, who was uh, apparently one of the big session basses around that time that a lot of people used. And he was very popular. A guy named John Barlow Jarvis on keys, and then the great Carmine of Peace, who I, I think absolutely kills it on this album crushes it's a great band he's got a great rocking band and he's rod stewart so he has to have a lot of ballads yeah and that's what people are like you know it's something about rod grabbing an acoustic guitar and singing these songs in his raspy voice he knows that that's his shtick so he's gonna throw in a couple of them and some people think oh it's that tired formula here he is with rod in his ballads in his acoustic but if, if it works why is it tired? I, I think it's great. But go ahead. Ba- go ahead. No, I was going to say balladeers are underrated. Come on. Uh, but And that's a guy who can interpret the hell out of this song. And he did. You know, speaking of Elton John, he did a wonderful co- uh, cover of Country Comfort, which I think oh, is so good. It's That version of Country Comfort is fantastic to the point yep. where Elton even tipped his hat and said, that's his song now. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, don't sleep, uh, Zeus, don't sleep on Steve, Cro- the great Steve Cropper from, you know, from the old uh, Stax days, the guy who played with the Blues Brothers and, and played on all those amazing um, records with Otis Redding and everything, wrote word on Redding. He's on this record. David Foster. Foster, of, yeah. Is, and Nicky Hopkins, who played with everyone. I mean, mm-hmm. oh, you're missing one more. John Mayo plays the harmonica. Uh, I was just going to mention, I was, I was gonna like, mention him, too, when we got to the song. But, yeah, you got that legend. Yes. And then you got yeah. the producer, yeah. Tom Dowd. Yep. Yes, legendary. So you got yes. all these people part of this. And to me, I, I just I, I want to put it out there for you guys. Recognize it. Give it a listen. See if you like it. So right. that's why I picked this. So the first <laughs> thing we're going to do then is talk about covers. Tom, have any thoughts about glaring at Rod okay. Stewart's face? All right. So I'm going to be completely honest with you here. OK. I, I like the cover. I'm going to tell you why. OK. I, it's very of the time. It's it's mid late seventies. It's it reminds me of if you. It's almost like if you zoomed in on the cover of like Hotel California. It gives me that vibe. It's yeah. got the it's yeah. got the it's got the trees in the background, the bright bright glowing sunset in the background, like Hotel California. 70s. Yeah, seventies. And I'm I'm sorry, Rod Stewart looks cool as fuck on this cover. Yeah, I'm sorry. He's got the big gold earring. His shirt is unbuttoned. The collar is up. He's got that badass hairdo that only he can pull off. He looks like a friggin' Russian hockey player from the 80s. Like, I, He's I, like I, Pavel Bure. Yeah, I mean, I like the I mean, the front cover. I like the back cover. I love because look at that outfit with the scarf. And, he, and it's like a, like a dog. I forget I mean, who it, told that joke. Somebody made a joke once. Like how cool Lenny Kravitz is. But yeah. they're like, he can't just be like, oh shit, let me just run to the store and get something. Right. Like he's got a whole like, routine. But of Rod how Stewart, to dress up. Yeah, and he pulls it off. Rod Look Stewart right there. He's like, oh God, my dog ran out. I'm just gonna go grab my dog. And meanwhile, I'm Hold gonna on. Look like the coolest. Let me get my guy matching in- scarf. Right. Let me get right. this. Let me do my eyeliner. Hold on. It's incredible. And then one other thing, too. So I don't know if you guys have this in the CD, but inside inside the vinyl is like a little comic book. Yes. No. I have okay. that. I don't. That okay. came with the original. That came oh, with the original. I don't have thing. this. Okay. So for each song, there's a different piece of artwork yes, based I on don't have each, it. Oh, it's, it's, it's like for, like for this, like look at this, Zeus. I'm, I know we're an audio podcast, but for You're Insane, it's got a picture of like a crazy looking woman. 
So, f- so I for each, have it. yeah. So for each song, there's a different piece of art. That's it's great. Weird. They put it in the new, in the new in version because that's in the, in the original. Version. And as you know, yeah. if you if you know Tom, that's how that's how Elton used to do it. Every yeah. Elton John have, album had a full libretto with photographs and the yeah. lyrics printed out and artwork. That's fantastic. I, I mean, look at that. that. If you didn't know anybody, if you looked quickly, you might think that's a woman right there. But that that's Rod Stewart. <laughs> that's Rod Stewart drinking something. But anyway, I, I I think it's a cool cover. It's of the time. And I, I just, I, I think he, look, he's just a fucking cool dude. I hate to sound, I hate to sound like I'm like 12 years old, but he's just a cool dude. It sounds like when we did the Michael Hutchinson, remember we were talking in excess, in excess and everyone's like, Jesus guys, calm down. You guys are like salivating over a guy. I'm like, I think it's he, the same thing. He is the, you look at this and you see him and you say rock star. Yes, a rock star. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. It's like you can look up the definition. You'd be like, "This is what a rock star looks oh, like." And can just I? So fucking cool. Okay, so you just you just nailed one of the reasons why he got shit on during this time by the critics. Okay. 1976. Okay, we're all digging on like that's the other reason I thought. Oh, 76. They probably had me on because of my Destroyer book because I was all into the 76. <laughs> I might even have mentioned this record in my book, but yeah. 1976. This is. Right when punk music, which started in 74 and 75, was in the midst of really kicking in. Yep. And there was a huge backlash against the Pink Floyds and the Rolling Stones and the the excess, the excess. And Rod Stewart with the planes and the hair and the limos in the back of the cover. And like you said, dressed like a a rich guy. I mean, and that cover, like you said, it does evoke L.A. These are L.A. cats. Recorded in LA studios. Yeah. I mean, if you didn't know any better, that that's that's LA. That's the LA. That's yeah. what it is. That's the yeah. LA sun shining behind him. And yeah. I'll use your guys' joke and reverse it uh, by saying, uh, uh, "That's what you might call a handsome man." <laughs> oh yeah, yeah James yeah. coming yes. in. I like it. <laughs> that is <laughs> exactly that- woman. I don't know, but he <laughs> looks good. So, but you're right. He, and he's that's a rock the thing star. I agree with you. It just to me, that's what he evokes. And that's what he's always been is that's why he, he's a great solo front man. He's got that looks and he still looks pretty decent for a guy's age. He can still perform pretty decent his I, age. I, I have to just jump in here real quick since we're talking yeah. about Rod Stewart. I love the the type of music that he's performing. I love those standards that Frank Sinatra. Yeah, that's the uh, old I, I, songbook. I, I love that. I love that. That music is right in my uh, Right up my alley. I love that stuff. I, but I, I hate that he does it. I just <laughs> oh. think it's extremely, I just think it's super, super corny. I right. think it's, I think, I know he's Rod Stewart and the guy like, oh, Susan I like it because I like his sing voice the phone to book. sing those songs. I was just going to say, I know he, you love his voice. He could sing the phone book, but I'm like, dude, that's not Rod Stewart. That's, that's the wedding singer but up there it, singing these songs. But is it? It is because he does everything. Like he you know can what it's get like? away with it. And 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 I know we gave it credit when we did the review, but it's like Paul Stanley doing Soul Station. I don't want to hear you do that. You you do it well. It sounds nice, but that's not what I want to hear Paul Stanley do. I don't want to hear Rod Stewart sing "Strangers in the Night." I just don't want to hear it. I do. I want. <laughs> okay, I'd well, love to hear him well, sing that, it. I'm glad. And, I'm and glad. obviously, other people because all those albums go to I, number one. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. But because it's all people say, like my mom. It's all like eighty year old Italian people who live in Florida with my mom. That's who's buying that. <laughs> <laughs> and me, Woo, Rod over here. <laughs> but, but the other thing is, I heard recently he was talking about, and this is prior to Jeff Beck passing away. Like mm-hmm. that, he wanted to come back and bring back the rock songs and do a rock or again I, and put I this stuff that. aside but he, he probably like i can sing in this register i can yeah. do the crooning song book and i can do the christmas songs and still kill it yeah. financially and sell out everywhere and it's probably easier on his voice no you're right and trying you're to right. scream stay with me you yeah. know true true and i'm gonna i'm gonna come right in the middle i guess that's why i'm here i'm gonna yes I'm gonna position myself right in the middle here number one rog stewart had one person, one vocal hero that he worshipped above all else. Oh, I know that. And that was Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke. Yeah. And Sam Cooke had a career as a wonderful black singer, songwriter, producer, everything. Ran his own label, his own publishing. Sam Cooke man. appealed to the central part of America. He appealed to white audiences and everything else. Yep. But when he got into a club, when he got around people, you know, uh, his people, his culture, 
He let it loose. And if you listen to the Harlem live Harlem, recording yeah, from, I know, I know it's yeah. Rod Stewart, right? Everything Rod Stewart brings to the table is that. So it's interesting. Rod Stewart's doing Sam Cooke in reverse. Yeah. Right. Imagine that's, that's pretty wild. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. But you know, I, I, as soon as Zeus started smiling and nodding his head, that yep. Harlem show from 63, I think is, is I, I, the phrasing and everything. You're like, Oh my God, this is everything Rod Stewart. And doing it well rod stewart did that well so yeah. i think it's very interesting now that stewart is you know he's transitioned to the singing these ballads that are appeal to a wider and in, in your point tom older audience but yeah 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 nice. and, and a guy loved ballads and crooning yeah yeah, yeah but they well, wouldn't sir. release his album they held right. that album back for years yep. because it was too black That's yeah right. too much yep. of the crowd singing back to him yep because it was they were just going nuts so oh, like, bring it on home. The crowd is singing half the song with him going nuts and like, oh, we can't release this. Yes. And then later they release. They, and I've always tried to get the correct version of that. Yeah, album. there's a, several versions. That's right. Yeah. Several versions where they tone this shit down. Yes. Well, let's get that black music out of here. Yes. Like, dude, it's Sam Cook. What are you doing? Yep. And, uh, and you know what turned me on to it was the Ali movie. They had a guy try to do a version of that in the movie when he's singing Bring It On Home when Ali's coming out in the beginning of the movie to fight. Oh, the Sonny Will Liston. Smith one? The Will yeah. Smith one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. When he's coming out to fight Sonny Liston, there's somebody that's trying to emulate the uh, pretend he's Sam Cooke. It's good, but it ain't Sam Cooke. But right, right. you can see what was happening back then. Yeah, and I get it. I get it 100% that he doesn't. But that's why Rod does a lot of Motown stuff. Mm-hmm. All in his albums, and uh, there's a great love and affinity for it. And I think he can pull it off. He's got that soulful voice. But mm-hmm. anyways, let's go to a couple of the facts on the album. The album was released November 4th, 77. Oh, early. Well, Tom. that late? 77, huh? Yeah. yeah. So Tom Dow was the producer. That guy's done a million different things. Almond Brothers, Eric Clapton, Willie Nelson, Aretha Franklin, you name it. It went to number two on the U.S. Billboard, number three in the U.K. It's triple platinum. It was his eighth studio album. I've mentioned the band. We've talked about the cover. And the album has like several different parts. It's got rock, psychedelic rock, funk, blues, R&B, soul, prog rock. You name it. It's got everything on this album, I think. And maybe that's where he gets a little bit like, hey, figure, find your lane. But I like that there's everything on it. And uh, I'm waiting Agreed. to hear what you guys think and we can get started. Yeah, I agree. And one last thing just on that. I, I did drop the ball on that. I was thinking of A Night on the Town, which preluded this. And it has his other great ballad from that period, which is Tonight's the Night. Oh, so and, that's a great song. Oh, oh. It's, that's a truly great song. And I actually yep. think it's a better song than than the one that's on this record, although the one on this record is sweet. But um, it, it, and so I always conflate those two. Killing yeah, Georgie to, and all that shit. Oh, that's a gorgeous song. But the yeah, best yeah, song right. is not on. You didn't even mention it yet. Come on. You know what What's the best that? song on that? What's the on first that? cut is the deepest. That's the, the first best song. Cut is the, you know, and that's a. Um, and then Cheryl Crow ruined it, but that's all right. That's a yeah. Cat Stevens song, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, oh, I think. Yeah. yeah. Him singing it is just incredible. Yep. Yeah, he did own it. He owned these songs. He was kind of like Elvis in that way. We take a song, forget it. It's his. You know, the funniest thing is your song. I knew his version of it because there used to be a radio show, Tom, in Boston. That I forget what station it was like classic rock, but they were promoting it and they would play Rod Stewart's Your Song. And I'm like, why do I? I don't remember him doing that. It's not an Elton John song. Right. And I'm like, why are, why are they produce? Why were they advertising Rod singing it? But I got, I, you know, certain songs, I, I just heard him, his version, not yeah. the others, but I knew both. But anyway, yeah. um, we can get ready to the tracks. You guys good? Let's go. Let's do All it. All right. <laughs> First track. All right. So we start off with Hot Legs. Right out of the gate, I'm digging this right here. This is a combination right off the bat of some of my favorite bands. It sounds like. Obviously, right off the bat, sounds like the Stones. Okay, everybody knows that. That's not that's no revelation there. But I'm, as I'm listening, I'm hearing Southern Rock. I'm hearing Leonard yes. Skinner, Black Crows, Zeppelin, all the stuff I love. I'm hearing pianos. I'm hearing such incredible sleazy, bluesy grooves. The band is out of their minds. The the funky little bass breakdown, the solo. I mean, the, the the song is legendary for a reason. Everybody knows this song, and they, and they should. Like you said, Zeus, the band is just crushing it on so many levels. Like I can't get enough of all the guitars. This to me, <laughs> yeah, exactly. there's another there's another song on this album that we'll get to. 
but this to me is like it, it's a, it's a couple of years removed, but this is like Sticky Fingers era, like Stones, like just that really groovy guitar, the crunchy guitar that you didn't really hear a lot this time. Not like metal guitar, but just great riffs, great faces groove. type guitar. Fa- Ron that's Wood. what I was going to say. Re- faces. It, remi- right. it reminds. It's it reminds like faces. Me of stay with me and shit stay like with that. me. Exactly. I'm the same way with you, Tom, and I, I and we'll. The the thing that got me is like I know Rod Stewart, I knew his voice. When I started getting into this album, these band and the band, yeah, I didn't realize he had a real band behind. I think it's yeah. Rod Stewart and a bunch of different yep. people and yep. whatever. I didn't realize how good of musicianship is on yeah. this album until I really bought this and started listening. And this is a great example. James, go ahead, brother. James, go ahead, buddy. What do you what do you got? Hot legs. Yeah, a couple of things. So uh this 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 song has aged well. Um, yeah, when he says, "Are you still in school?" Well, the, the, I was just going to say the, the, the this is the same year uh, Kiss released "Christine 16 on Love Gun. So yeah, but seventy-seven was a rough year. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I was going to say everything that Tom said. I echo. Uh, I, it's it's infused with great country rock, which yeah. again in L.A. was really starting to kick in. Now the Eagles type thing. I you know, and when I was listening to it a couple of times, I was thinking, boy, the Georgia Satellites. From the 80s must have been yes. listening to this record. Um, <laughs> so very country feel, very bluesy. And this is what I was saying before. And this is a classic music writer thing to say. But Go the ahead. first song and the last song of a record to me always indicates how great an album is and how mm. it connects. He opens up with a full tribute to his old band, who's yes. now in the past. And his old buddy Rod Wood, who did those riffs as good as Keith and as good as these other guys, which is why Keith's like, come on, join us. And just like you said, the bluesy, boozy, just it's barely hanging in there. At the end, they, it's going to end. Nope, nope, it's not going to end. <laughs> oh, he's right, now he's got a couple more things to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and he throws in pussy whipped, which makes no sense there, but it's so raw and so, you know. Oh, we'll so, get to that. It's so rod. And he's just, it's just using with toxic sexuality it's yeah. just so pure and you know the music fits and of course he is just killing it on the vocals when he goes up on those breaks i love you honey that's oh, just oh. incredible so yep. just a wonderful way to open this record and if you you know run my thread all the way through it has to open this way yeah. it has to open with a barn burner because this is a record as you said earlier it is has a shit ton of ballads in it. Yep. So, All right. Hot wait. legs. It made it to number 28 on US billboards. I think number five in the UK. Uh, it's the second single from the album. It was written by Rod Stewart and the guitarist Gary Granger. Uh, it's been covered by Bon Jovi, Tina Turner, Tom Jones. Um, I, I just, and it opened up his Unplugged album. If you remember, I love that album, by the way. Oh, I don't remember that. Okay. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah I love that album. Yeah, yeah. I, don't I remember, yeah. I remember the Unplugged album. I don't remember him opening up with this, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I just love the opening guitar and I just put the same thing Stone slash Faces. Uh, I, of the three guitarists, if that guy is Billy Peck, that's the lead guitarist on this. Those guitar fills. Oh, yeah. Like, Duckberry like, City, USA. Oh, my God. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why I, I still think no matter how great people talk about Chuck Berry, he still could be the greatest guitarist of all time because people are still stealing his songs yep. and his moves. And they still like. That's as good as it gets. Whatever mm-hmm. he did back then, those riffs are just fantastic. you can dance to those leads. Oh, my that's God. the difference with Chuck Berry and everybody else who played lead guitar is you dance when he starts playing that lead. Well, Keith's like that too. Keith Richards, well, you, that's his idol. Yeah, yeah. you want to move your ass. Yeah, that's, that's right. What you do. I mean, I, I, we could go on about Chuck Berry forever. That he's still, I think, underappreciated, but that's all right. Um, the I just love the drums before the, the he kicks in the voice. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. Bang, and then oh, and then the song starts off. I he builds it up. I don't know what it was in the 70s. I've tried to get somebody to explain it to me how they just let songs breathe, and mm-hmm. you can hear the drums, whereas the drums are just muted now. You can hear the beat, but it's because production start. was all production was all analog back then. It yes. wasn't there wasn't a lot of process. So there much wasn't better. A, yeah, there wasn't a lot, all this processing and pro tools and all this. It was, it was, 
it was just analog plug and play and record. But it's right. It, and the room made Zeppelin. a big deal. Yes. Yeah. Listen yep, to yep. Zeppelin. Listen to Keith Moon. Then you listen to like Ian Pace, even Deep yep. Purple albums. Yep. Boop, 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 bang. And you know, you can build up to that that cymbal crash and you can hear it even though the guitars are playing something different. Yep. It's just a different style, nice and clean. Carmine, I just love it. He builds up on this and it's very Bonham stuff. And even Bonham oh, used yeah. to like say he took some stuff from Carmine. Give him some credit there. His um, fills his fills at the end of that is fantastic. Uh, yeah, Carmine, yeah. Apiece, oh Car- 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 Carmine Apiece has never met a fill he didn't love. I mean, you, yeah, you God go, bless go, him. Go, go, go a year later when he's on Paul Stanley's solo album, go oh listen to that God, song. Love it. The whole the half oh, the song is a right. drum fill. He plays yeah. the drums on Paul Stanley's songs. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. On one of the songs. Yeah. Yep. So I love how you can pick up all the instruments. You can hear the drums. And then if you really concentrate, now you can pick up the piano, that like that uh, saloon type piano. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, like, right? That Peter Chris solo album type piano that we always Or Nicky Hopkins. Can, yeah. Or Ian Stewart from the Stones. You know, oh, that. Oh, or, or, yeah. Man, or, 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 or Johnny Johnson. If we're going to be talking about, you know, Chuck Berry, Johnny Johnson, the great Johnny Johnson. Played yeah. on all those Chuck Or Berry's. even, or I would, we, we, Zeus and I have mentioned him before, Rolf from the Muppets. Yeah, same that's thing. It. It's, it's Rolf. <laughs> that's what you say. That's who's on Peter Chris solo album. It's Rolf. <laughs> Poor I did James. not see that come. <laughs> Hold on. I did not oh, see we that do coming. That. We, we do that we all talk, the time. It's Rolf. Do you have any idea how many times we have referenced Rolf's piano playing in, the, in these on, episodes? On Kiss, on Kiss songs? <laughs> that's how we, that's how you describe that sound. It's uh, Rolf on the, on the piano. But right, right, yeah. regardless, um, the other aspect of it is you hear after the first verse, I love you, honey. And then yeah. you wah, 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 wah. It sounds it. like Buck Cherry's lit up. Oh yeah, 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 that's right. Which, which, which sounds like shock me. Yeah, yeah. That's where I got it. All, all comes back to Hoochie Coochie Man by by, yeah. uh, yep. by the great uh, Muddy Waters. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's a great song. Uh, and then I love how he pronounces uh, vitamin e, vitamin E as we would pronounce it. Yes, yeah. but, because I always used to be like, what the hell is he saying? I don't understand what he's saying. And I read the lyric, and I'm like, where is he saying vitamin E? V- vitamin, I don't know. Vitamin, yeah. vitamin. vitamin. Yeah, yes, vitamin. the English way. And you know that I was going to say, Rod Stewart did a great job of keeping his English accent in these things, despite trying to sound like a soulful, you know, Southern black guy, or yep. in the case of like Sam Cooke, like a gospel yeah. singer. But I wanted to say that the the cool thing about that is the uh, and, and you know when I did the podcast with Adam Duritz from County Crows, we did a three part series on Ron Wood and 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 Rod Stewart, and wow. we were talking about how. Rod Stewart had created this character from the very beginning, like this, you know, sad sack. You know, I'm just being seduced by this woman. You think of Maggie May. <laughs> and what did yeah. I do? Poor to get- guy. And she's screwing my brains out. <laughs> and I don't know why. I really should be back to school, but I can't help having sex with this older woman. <laughs> and just, I, it's the same kind of thing. Like, she's yep. kicking his ass. I got to go to work tomorrow. What are yep. you doing? Yep. You're killing me. Yep. But wait one second. There's another running theme in Rod Stewart's stuff. And he says it in the first verse, too. And that's something he has to do with having sex with women and then kicking them out the door. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, it. Yeah. It's like three or four different songs of it. And it's, it's always like in the morning, th- make sure like, you're gone. Yeah, but it's always at like three or four in the morning. Like we always used to tease Paul. Paul would always reference time in some of his songs. Right. Like, and, and Rod's like, gotta be, what? who's that knocking on my door? Gotta be a quarter to four. Uh, it's like, a road yeah. song. It's yeah, a road exactly. song. It's room exactly. service. It's exactly. room service by Kiss. Yeah. And, yeah. and th- that's a great point, Zeus, because that's the other part of him, right? So he's the predator and he's the one being being you know seduced and bounced Remember around and stay with me right stay in with the me morning. Same thing. <laughs> right and so once again <laughs> keep it in the back kick you out the door keep keep it in the back of your mind because when we get to the last track on this record you're going to see yep. a whole other it's going to be a mea culpa to that, all of that, this it's fabulous oh, i'm sure we'll Great get to point. that part yep but um then you know you got the phil chen bass solo boom, right. boom, yeah i love it boom 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 boom, boom. um and then you got <laughs> carmine killing it right before the solo Boom. Yes. Heavy drum beats. And then this blistering guitar solo. Yep. That you're like, holy shit. But then my favorite part of silliness is these like outro vocal things he says. Keep my pencil sharp. <laughs> That's a Paul Stanley that? lyric. You're still in school. Okay, Gene Simmons. Yep. Oh, you're pussy whipped. Yep. And then <laughs> 
Hot, and then after he says, oh, you're pussy whipped, he says, hot legs. I just love your lips. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's Rod Stewart, uh, baby. Yeah. When yep. he's talking about being pussy whipped, I wonder where his mind is going. Yep. <clears throat> it's filthy. It's, you know, filthy. It's, yeah. It really is. But to me, that's all badassery. But we can't talk about this. And one of the main reasons we're doing this album. Hey, let's get to the video. Holy <laughs> shit. Dude, this is Holy like. Holy shit. This, look, I swear to God, this, I'm like, is this like the video for Come On Eileen? Is this Dexie's Midnight Runners right now? Like, what is happening here? The greatest comment I think I've ever seen on YouTube was because I watched this video a million times. It was someone that had written, like, this is what happens when you take the $100,000 budget and spend it on cocaine and you're st- <laughs> you're stranded in Costa Rica. That's I'm like, where the fuck is this video taking I, place? I mean, one minute you get the guy doing the Chuck Berry down the train tracks, oh, which is kind of like cool. horrible. And then, and, then, and then, horrible. But and then all of a sudden, I'm like, where did this migrant family come from? Yeah, they, yeah, they're just, yeah. they're just like they watch. They're watching this. They said they're stranded in Costa Rica. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> like, it's, it's like, it they, like paid, they, they bought like a one way airplane ticket to get to wherever they st- <laughs> stuck there. That's not that's not that ain't no USA city. That ain't, I don't know where that is. Uh, well, the kid, he, one of the kids had a Peru shirt on, but it was spelled P I R U. That's they think they're in Peru. They're fucking right. all on so, coke. And you guys failed to mention the whole key to the goddamn thing, which is him singing between a woman's legs the <laughs> yeah. entire oh, The right. woman is that's never the, you never see her face. No. It's always you can barely see anything else. Yeah. Just your legs. You're always peeking between his legs. He's singing between her legs. But what is and that? then there's a then there's like that guy that looks like what was that willow guy from those Star Wars movies? Looks like a, a like a black willow guy. Who's that guy that was in oh, willow? The, uh, yeah, yeah, What's his like name? A Warwick Davis. That's it. He looks like yeah. a little black Warwick Davis guy. Yeah. Sitting, he looks like he, that guy looks like he's like honestly, like not even four feet tall. I don't know where they found that character, but he's just sitting there at the at the gas station, just looking. What and what's and, and what's with Rod Stewart's like magenta jumpsuit? <laughs> like, I, like that. That's a that's a women. That's that's like I, I, the video is out of. That's the, a out great jumpsuit. Do they have them for men? <laughs> They did. They did not put any. I mean, clearly, and this is back in the day. I, I was saying to Zeus when he sent it to me. I said I remember this vividly. Of uh, being on MTV a lot, like that yep. first six months when they had no videos and they just yes. threw out all the old stuff, and. You know, it was on, which made no sense at all because in 1982, this song was already kind of dated because it's already an homage, as you guys said, to the 50s yeah. and 60s and bluesy early 70s. Yep. But it, it, yeah, I mean, it's just it. You you mentioned it. Start me up, and I always think back to um, to Jump Van Halen. Mm-hmm. That that video they, really? that was they always make a j- joke. They spent more money on booze than they did an actual you know production value. Oh yeah, because there's nothing in oh, that video. David Lee Roth's fucking wardrobe. It's just, yeah, it's just Eddie Van Halen smiling for three like, minutes. Like the <laughs> video starts off with them on the Sanford and Son truck, and they're just driving down in this fucking area, and like Rod Stewart's doing like the chicken dance. He's like, bump, 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 bump. like we see him in the video. I don't know what the fuck he's doing. But then they go and then they start shooting the video. You got Phil Chen with a fucking hayseed in his mouth. I don't know why he's fucking doing that. But they never show the girl. It's always him between his legs. Um, And between the 30 and 40 second mark in this video, I marked it. If you watch, you can tell how fucking coked up Rod is. He, He starts, the camera like closes in on his face. He's all like cockeyed smiling like all fucked up and then right before the he starts singing he does like a like a fucking snort or something stuck with his nose he is definitely all coked up the keyboard player has a fucking railroad engineer hat have you did you see that the fuck is he wearing his stupid lid on every one of these guys looks ridiculous they're all dressed like so timed out um, I, I don't know what the hell's going on. Rod has got the crazy old red overalls. And then that guitar solo you talked about, Tom, I think that's the silliest thing. He's wearing a stupid beret. And he's doing the fucking Angus Chuck Berry move. Yep. It just doesn't Donald, work. It looks I, I, I love how Zeus is breaking this down as if it's Citizen King. Oh, oh, oh my God. There's way more. <laughs> oh, we do that. When it comes to these videos, we have to. And it's then incredible. They, and then yes. at the end, they all. They're all coked up 
on the Sanford and Son truck going <laughs> hot legs. And every one of these Peruvian fucking drug lord kids are like running after them. <laughs> drug they're just lord running, kids. They're fucking... <laughs> And then they're just chanting hot legs. <laughs> the whole fucking village must be like, what the fuck is this? Wait, who are those people? That's clearly an example of just you guys run through this song 10 times and we'll make a video out of it. We'll try to oh, do something. Yeah. Oh, totally. That right. is totally yeah. like the like like they said, they wasted the budget on cocaine. And uh, let's just fucking hang out at this gas station and just uh, sing the song and bring some chick with good legs. And I'll sing between Pretty much. legs. Oh. Anyways, I had to get that off my chest. I've been holding well done, that back fellas. for years. Well done. All right. Let's go to song two. All right. So we got You're Insane. Now we're starting to hear some songs that I don't really know very well from this album. But I'll tell you right off the bat, incredible. I mean, this is funk level uh, uh, turned up to 10. I absolutely think it's amazing. Slinky, sleazy guitars, an incredible groove. The lyrics kind of made me laugh because, like, they're just like <laughs> rhymy lyrics, like something like Ace would write. Like, it just just very like low level lyrical content, which is fine, you know. But I will say this: I, I think the band sounds incredible. Again, Carmine crushing it. That little that funk guitar groove, and I'm listening to this. I'm like, I cannot believe this has never been sampled in a hip hop song. Like so, some of this, some of this main riff, this groove could have been easily co-opted into some kind of hip hop song, but I, I had never heard it before in my life. I think it's a fabulous song. I think it's great. I think what it's do you nice mean, Tom? Song. You What's don't, that? you don't like you drive your Mustang down Sunset Strip and in the back seat a big black whip? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> it's Fucking classic, terrible. Classic. So this is a classic example of what we were talking about earlier. Here's Rod making fun of, you know, bougie. You know, L.A. coked up. You know, this is his his, his it, it way of doing the the Eagles. Uh, you know, every Eagle song, which is essentially a femme fatale who has a lot of money, who completely seduces you know the poor, unsuspecting Midwesterner uh, into their into their lair. And uh, you know, that's that's kind of what this song is. And in, in a way. He's he's trying to get, I think, he's trying to straddle both. He's doing a disco, pre-disco, round disco kind of funk song, but he's also making fun of people who will eventually sort of represent that culture. And, you know, uh, what's the, the Eagles song? Well, everything on Hotel California talks about that, but uh, which I think is also 77, if I'm not mistaken, right? That record came out in 70, 76 or 77? 76. Six. So it, it just, it has that. It's, it's just an L.A., it's just him going right down, using a woman to represent all the people who he's encountered. And in a way, he's trying to stay arm's length. He's trying to be a, he's trying to be a commentator instead of someone who is completely steeped in that kind of milieu. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To me, um, Tom hit the nail on the head. It's a funk track. Boom, oh, boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom. And I, what I pick up on is like, again, like, God, this band is fucking tight. This yeah. isn't no like, oh, just add people like you think like in this 80s. Oh, this guy will play him. This guy will play just yeah, it's no studio fucking, cats like studio. Yeah, cats. yeah, yeah. But this is like a band band. Right. And and for me, I, I just think it works. It it, it 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 kicks ass. The bass is insane. That guy is that guy is good. That guy, Phil Jen, he's good. And I like how the instruments breathe throughout the song. You can pick up on them. But I like this part, Tommy goes, you got no brain. You're insane. And my mind goes to insane in the membrane. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Insane. yeah, that's what it comes up to. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's a pretty good track. There, So far, we got a couple good rock songs kind of rocking so far. And yep. it's ballad time. Yes. So track three, you're in my heart. Okay. Beautiful song. Famous song. Love it. I think it's fantastic. I, I He sounds amazing. I love the instrumentation in it. I just, I really think it's an incredible song. I think it's popular for a reason. It's famous for a reason. I love singer songwriter types of music. You know, Elton John is one of my all time favorite artists. Like Billy Joel is one of my all time favorite artists. Simon and Garfunkel, Paul Simon solo, you know, James Taylor. I love I love that kind of stuff when it's done well. And I think this song is it, it kind of fits in that in that category for me, if that's kind of a if that's a fair assessment. 
Uh, and I think it's a really nice break from the first two songs that we had, you know, hot legs, this bluesy Rick rocking song, you know, you're insane, a little bit of funk. Let's slow it down and, and bring this in. And I, I think it's fantastic. I think it's kind of iconic for reasons. I think it's a very pretty song. Yeah. It's a beautiful song. Very well produced. This is the most, I talk about David Foster. He had yeah. to you know, get in someone's ear. This thing is just so pristine and the guitars Kind of the, the 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 classical Spanish kind of guitars that lead in, they stay yes. throughout. I think I hear a mandolin in there. For certain, you hear that beautiful uh, violin that comes in by the Incredible. second verse, mm-hmm. and and the verses are beautiful. But that chorus is epic. It's just yeah. so singable. It's very McCartney. It's very you know. As soon as you hear it, you got to sing it. Uh, everybody always talks about he's a huge uh, football as they call it over there, but soccer fan, and he names. His favorite teams, the way you, which is such a guy thing, but you don't expect that from Rod Stewart. It's like, <laughs> right, I'm right. comparing you to. He's a hooligan. The yeah. <laughs> I'm comparing you to Celtic United because I, that's how much I love you. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, like, just like you guys saying, I, I, I love you so. You're, the, you're like the Boston, Bru- you're like the 71 Boston Bruins. No, anyway, so the, but was that the year they won? 71? The Bruins? Yeah. Uh, 70, 70, 70, 69, 72. 70, and then 72. 71, 72. That's the Bobby Orr one. That's the Bobby Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr ones. So it's just such a guy thing. So I think it's just sweet. Like I said, I always um, liked the previous one. Uh, Tonight's the Night, again, a great seduction song. But I think this is one of those things. You guys talk about it all the time in your Kiss podcast. After the hit, Beth, you know, give give the ballad to Peter. Let's give this another shot for the next Mm -hmm. record. I mean, it seemed like he had to do something like this, you know, where he – he talks about a, a woman almost in royal way, in a royal way. He's he's yeah. produce, he's producing the perfect woman, and he's trying his best. I love this. He puts the details in there about seeing her from across the room. He says hello, but she says goodbye, and you know it, everybody was being so lyrical and, and and everything. I'm just a regular. That there it is again. I'm just the regular loser hanging out here. <laughs> what? Give me a shot. Look my way, yeah. which is crazy because you know we just said about the cover and his right. rock star persona. But I just love how he embraces that, and you know he co-wrote the song. So what yeah. he's singing is coming straight from from the heart. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. Tom's right. Yeah. All right. So you're in my heart. And oh, by the way, uh, you're insane was written by Rod Stewart and Phil Chen. This okay. song was written just by Rod Stewart. Yep. It made it to number four in the U.S., three in the U.K., number seventeen, uh, adult contemporary. I believe it's the first single from the album. Um, yes. And, and I'm shocked it wasn't number one, Zeus. Yeah, when I looked I that up, too. I couldn't believe it. that was all over the radio when I was a kid. All yeah. when I was so, in high school. What's funny is he he's had so many like legendary relationships in the tabloids and stuff, and he's been all over the place. So he was dating somebody that's before my time, but I guess was a big name. This lady named Britt Eklund. Yes, you remember mm-hmm. her? Yes. So she eventually sued him for like, I inspired some of your songs and this and that. So everybody originally knew that this song was written about her. And then, yep, right. you know, so you get comments. I've always tried to figure out what he's saying and certain things. So I've seen more recent interviews where he tries to clear it up. He's like, it's about my two favorite football teams. It's not just about her. No, no, no. I've oh, got other people. Yeah. It's about, it's about a, three different women's, my two favorite football teams, Celtic and United, my love of Scotland. <laughs> and even in the end, you can say it's about my parents when I when I say you're my best friend and you're in my soul. I'm like, dude, all right, we know there's a lawsuit there, but well, he's not, being not- he's being smart because he's pretty much saying prove it, prove that what I just said isn't well, true. When you start talking about your Dutch accent and your big bosom lady, uh, well, it's pretty yeah. your fashion sense and your Beardsley print. It's pretty specific who he's talking yeah. about. Plausible deniability. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was one of those. She was one of those women that looked like him. That that was kind of like the whole Mick Jagger B- Bianca thing. We're like, oh, he's yes. marrying yeah. himself. You know. Yes. Like, yes. And the it's funny like thing is, that's the one where he has the photo of him, and is one of the most disgusting photos. It's him in that awful like fucking speedo, nut, speedo yeah. where all his pubes are basically out. It's and awful. She's got like I think his his bottom is like smaller than hers. Yeah, in the ba- in the bikini suit. They're if you if you have a f- yeah, if oh, you have a follow, fucking gross. If you have a follow, super seventies sports oh. on Twitter, yeah. that that he, <laughs> yeah. he he posts that, and it's it's a, it's a picture. 
It just shows you how different the seventies were back then. Put it that way. You can't unsee that. You can't oh, unsee no, it. No, no, it's not a pretty picture. No. But when you listen to this and I put it on my headphones, you get that seventies right left ears. I love that mixture. mix. Yep. The mix. Yeah, it's a great the mix. acoustics in one side yes. and then his voice comes out in the next. And it's yep. just that rod voice. Which is fantastic. And it sounds different than everything else on the record. Did you notice that? The way I think it does, yeah. It's almost like they said, this is going to be the single. It's been like 10 days on this. <laughs> yeah, it's produced it's differently. work harder yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's got, um, I think, that classic 70s singer-songwriter chorus yeah. that we all know. You're in my heart. And then yep. in concert, when they sing this, the whole crowd is singing this. Yeah. And it's really one of those, like, Dude, he's getting laid. If he tells any girl, yeah, I wrote this for you. Yep. Like any girl's like, okay, I'm going to bank it tonight. Then you feel right. It's, it's true. He sings it so understatedly, though. You know, when you were just saying that, I'm reminded of, you know, seeing yeah, Billy Joel in the garden. You know, where, like you say, yeah, when, when, you, when he gets into Piano Man, everybody sings along. But in this song, it is a sing along, but that's not how he's doing it. It's not right. a big, you know, it's not a big, da, 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 you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's yeah. very sweet. It's very singular. It's very it's uh, personal. Uh, it's a very personal, intimate. Yeah. Great, great line. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, to me, if you like Rod Stewart's voice and you like it, him, this, this is, this is like crack cocaine. This is the yep. stuff you, <laughs> you live for. Like you want this. It works for you. If you think he's cheesy and all that, you're going to hate this shit. But there's yeah. also great lead if you listen to the lead guitar fills on the chorus. Yes. Pay, I, yeah. pay attention to the chorus and you'll hear the guitar in the background going. There's um, a video for this. It's Rod in a fucking restaurant playing acoustic guitar, yeah, singing into the camera. Like, and then my favorite part is how the fuck. And- yeah, and then my favorite part is how the the waiter just comes out with the violin. I'm like, oh, that guy's instead of <laughs> instead of instead of that guy bringing a bottle of wine and some bread, he comes out bringing his fiddle. Okay, yeah, I mean, for like, for the guys, <laughs> for the guy singing by himself, yeah. I'm gonna come over and serenade you. He looks like the guy on a pe- every pizza box or takeout <laughs> box. He's got that little mustache, <laughs> that parole mustache, you know, on him, and the slick hair, like the friggin', uh, I don't know, like those little French uh, detectives. <laughs> Oh, and any anybody who plays guitar watches that for two seconds and realizes Rod Stewart has no idea. Like he looks was, like he's never I'm, held a guitar I'm, ever. James, yeah. I was just going to say that it's like he's holding like a live snake in his hands. He has no yeah. idea what he's doing. Yeah, it's, it's like when you get those. Actor, right, I mean, the actor yeah. you see, took a verse right out of my hand. You get somebody doing a biopic and they, and they just the way they're holding the guitar is just. Yep. Yeah, it's like the anyway, actors when they yeah. play in baseball movies, dude. Yeah, nobody's nobody's holding the bat like that. Or the worst fucking athletic performance of all time, Bull Durham and fucking Tim Robbins throwing a baseball. Oh yeah, it looks like the worst <laughs> athlete. Like, dude, nobody throws a baseball. It looks so bad. I can't believe the the director's not like, all right, dude, somebody else got to fill in this guy. <clears throat> yeah. But anyways, then in the video, they also have soccer clips towards the end faded in the oh, background. Yeah. I'm so like, this weird. doesn't make sense. It's, it's like him so groaning to the woman, and in the middle, all of a sudden, they're like soccer highlights in the background. Well, maybe that's maybe that's so he could prove to Britt Eklund that the song isn't yeah. about her. It's like, look, I did this soccer clips. It's like- yeah. yeah, that didn't really work too well. All right, let's go to song number four. All right, Born Loose. So, this is probably the song I have the most notes written on. And as I'm when I first heard, I never heard this song before in my life. And I'm listening to this song and I'm like, I cannot believe it has taken me 45 years to hear this song. This fucking song is absolutely insane. Absolutely. I don't know how this song wasn't a hit. I don't know how this song wasn't beaten into the ground on classic rock radio. I don't know how everybody doesn't know about this song. It is. First of all, Carmine of Peace is a fucking God. Yeah, we, we already knew that. On this album, the amount of balls and muscle he adds to this song with his drum fills, with what he's doing during the chorus of this song, the keyboard, the the guitar riff, the band, you can't, you have to be in a coma to not want to move your body, (laughs) tap your toes, tap your hands along to hear this. And then it, it gets better because then the song slows down. And then they have a breakdown and then it speeds up. And then there's a friggin' harmonica outro. This song is just absolutely spectacular. What a revelation for me to hit. And I just kept listening and listening. And I'm like, 
I just, I can't, this is exactly the kind of stuff I love. This bluesy, stonesy, ballsy stuff. And I, I can't believe Rod Stewart crushed it with this. And I, I, I'm really, really, really surprised this was not a hit. This might be the best rock and tune on the record. Yeah. With oh, all I agree. respect to hot legs, even though I, you know, we'll, we'll talk about our rankings later. Yeah. But this, this song is 100% an homage to the faces. Totally. If you listen to a lot of the faces, of course, the most famous use of that is "Stay with Me," where it's gun, 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 and then at the yeah, end it goes into that, that rip guitar. roaring. Yes, it, it's similar to that. It, it slows down. It's almost as you guys were saying earlier. Someone said this to me years ago, and I and, and I it the reason why the Rolling Stones don't get as much credit as the Beatles or these other uh, groups for their writing is it sounds like they're organically just jamming, and somehow a song came out of it. Yes. And that's what this sounds like. And then getting just to I'll put my music writer hat on again. You yeah. listen to the lyrics of this thing, and it's him telling a story about just being a, a, a you know, rascal, just being one of those guys who just can fit yep. in. Yeah. And he's just he's unapologetic about it. He mentions his parents in it and the people around him and society. And he just he's like, it's a fuck it song. And yeah. and it's his fuck it song. And he's got a couple of them on, on this record. But again, I really do believe this is sort of his love letter to his past, to to growing up and wanting to be a rock star when everyone probably told him you're too ugly with a big nose and your voice is weird. And you're, you know, and he, he like I said, Rod Stewart's rise was such a circuitous route. It was zigzagged. All he, he, you know, people, he almost got this job and he almost sang on this record and he almost was able to do that. And but he finally found his tribe with the faces. And this song really is his, he's tipping his cap to his old pals. That's what I think. Uh, t- I totally agree. Yep. So Born Loose, Rod Stewart, Gary Granger, Jim Cregan. I just put drums and what a straightforward rock song. Yep. And another song about kicking a woman fucking out again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. What the fuck, dude? Uh, anyway. Uh, great solo. Then that breakdown. Wah, oh. wah, 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 wah. So I was good. waiting for him to go. I have a little change in my pocket, going <laughs> jingle, jingle, yeah. jingle. Yeah. There you go. Yep. There you go. That, yeah. that is where Georgia Satellite gets it. And I if you so. notice in the lyrics, there are a part where he says, "Keep your hands off me, baby." Like and then all of a sudden, Georgia Satellite. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it sounds awesome, but it is. You're right. I think you explained it just now perfectly they sound like it's just a band that just gets into a gym yep. like a small club and do you ever see that documentary on the stones i forget what it came out not too long ago and it showed the stones like their early career and anywhere they played fucking chicks are just running on stage attacking them men too yeah just jumping on and they're trying Riots. to play and yes. they're fucking this is in the six early 60s yes six, like, and they're just running on. That's what I picture Stay With Me sounds like. Like Rod trying to sing, people fucking jumping over, guitarists are just cranking. This is that type of song where it just gets out of control, fucking ma'am, and this band is just fucking killing it on stage. That's how much fun this sounds like. Yeah, I agree. It, it sounds like a jam, and this is John Mayer playing uh, the harmonica on this. So, uh, good way to end uh, side one. I can't believe four songs. Yeah, side one's over. Turn yep, it over. Yep. Side number two. Be ready in a minute. Here we go. <laughs> yep. All right. So, we go to You Keep Me Hanging On, a cover song originally made famous by the Supremes. Everybody knows that version. And then Carmina Pieces band, Vanilla Fudge, did it uh, not long after this one. Um, yep. And... It's a great song. I mean, I, I love the Supremes version. I like how this one starts kind of like the quiet, almost like instrumental. Like, it's like you don't know what's coming. And then the song kind of gets into gear. And I think the instrumentation of the band, like, especially coming after, you know, Born Loose was the last song on side one. So, like Zeus said, flip the record, side two, first song. I think it's a really interesting cover, but I, I really think it works. And I think rod's voice keeps this from being corny because i feel like this is the kind of song at this at this tempo at this pace in this this interpretation if you had somebody with kind of like a standard 70s voice i feel like it kind of could have been a little corny i just feel like rod adds a little bit of gravitas to it here i think I, i i think it's a really nice version of the song 
It's the best version of this song. Wow. Okay. It's the best. Now there's a couple of things. You nailed it. So I want to give props to my friend, Chris Barrera. I was just visiting with his family. We were down in LBI and I was telling him I was going on the show and he's a big fan of you guys. So oh, wow. good to say Great. hello. Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, he was like, I was like, you know what the, uh, Rod Stewart does? You keep me hanging on the vanilla fudge version, which opens up the you know late sixties. Yeah, it was a hit. It was a big hit. Big That's hit. Right. With the yep. with the with the with the Hammond organ, and then the ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba, and then all that stuff. And he's like, oh yeah, of course, Carmine a piece. It was their drummer. He probably brought it to Rod. And then these guys, like you mentioned, a great band, Tight as Hell. They got together and they said, let's make it even better. It's yep. more dramatic. And you called it, Tom. He pulls this off because he's such a great interpreter of yeah. lyrics and song. It's really a beseeching song. And I've, I've said this many times. I wrote a whole piece about there are no happy police songs one time for a magazine. There are <laughs> yeah. no happy Supreme songs. They're all about heartache, breakup, paranoia. Yeah. And he sings it that way. He takes all the pathos of that song and owns it. And when he's just a cappella there and everything just disappears, it's stunning. It's incredible. Yes. I think it's the best version of this song because it combines okay. the Supremes, it, who I love, but also the Vanilla Fudge, which I'm not a huge fan of, but I am a fan of that that arrangement. But he does, they do it even more bombastic. It's like it's it's like meatloaf. Yeah, it's uh, it's a great way to put it. That's why you're here. You're you're the rock, you're the rock author guy. You know how to put you know how to put things into words. So a great great way to say it. Thanks, but you yeah, yeah. I would say that this is the best version of this song. That's my hot take for this uh, particular episode for you. Guys. Okay. So uh, you keep me hanging on is written by the fucking legendary Brian Hole and Lamont Dozier and Eddie Holland. So I'm a big Motown Temptation Supremes fan. I, I I don't know if I like it. I I can't even almost compare it to the Supreme song because they're just so different. Completely. I can't like one more than the other because I don't think they're the same song. They're just completely different. I, I love the Supremes version. I love this version. And you guys forgot to mention that smoke show from the 80s. Kim Wilde did this. Oh, yes. That's right. Oh. <laughs> I lo- by a- the way, by the way, you're right. Kim Wilde was a smoke show. With the oh, my I little God. Crush on her as well. Yeah, yeah. That's yes. why I remember her. Done. She's kids in, in America. The right? Kids in America. Kids, kids right. in America. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple live clips because when I YouTube try to see if there was a video for this, and then there's a live clip of her singing it. Ooh. Yeah, I had a I had to take a quick detour watching her <laughs> sing it and move, and this tight black skirt just. Ooh. She's God. cute. Oh, I, lo- I also like the gender. Uh, we were talking about before you reminded me, Tom or Zeus, one of you guys brought up the fact that Tina Turner did hot legs. Which yes. Is a, ten, it's a gender flip. It's like when Linda Ronstadt did poor, poor, pitiful me, the Warren Zevon song. Yep. And this similar thing. It's like here, Rod is playing the victim again. Yep. again. You know, and, and, and he just can't get this girl back, which, which Diana Ross did so beautifully. She had such emotion, such, she was like a wounded sparrow when she said, yeah. yeah. And he though, sounds like a real desperate, I know yep. I know this might sound like blasphemy to you. I heard Poor Poor Pitiful Me in the 90s from Terry Clark. I'm like, this song is great. Yeah. I didn't realize it was a Warren Zevon song. There you go. I, wow. I, 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 never... I just knew I knew the country version of it was a huge in. I was like, wow, this girl can sing. This song is so fucking catchy. Yep. And I'm yeah. like, you know what? I don't really like any of her other songs, but how did she come up with this one? She, I wonder how it's <laughs> yeah. not her song. Yes. But yeah. anyway. women covered Warren very well. No, I'm not insulted at all. I, I, the first time I heard that song, Linda Ronstadt did it. I was just, oh, oh, okay. yeah. when will I be loved has been covered a million times. I heard Vince Gill's version of it. And I was like, Oh, this is a great song. I'm like that's a Linda Ronstadt. No, it's not. It's right. who's the original song. Buddy Holly. No, no, no. no. no the Everly doesn't. brothers. Right, but she does do a Buddy Holly. Brothers. What does she? Um, oh, she might do it, but I'm just saying that's the Everly Brothers song, right, and then right. Linda Ronstadt. Everyone calls it her song, yeah. but it's not. But regardless, anyways, I don't want to get too far off. This is just musicianship off the charts. Yeah, and I have Carmine's book. I have uh, Rod's autobiography, and I think Carmine mentioned it on our interview with him, or he might have mentioned it off the air because I. Off the air when we got off, we were talking about him and Kiss, but I wanted to be like, dude, I love Footloose and Fancy Free. I want to talk to him about that. He said, and it's in his book, that Rod went up to him when he first kind of joined the band and he said, man, I just love Vanilla Fudge's 
you know, you because you know Rod's a big motel. There you go. What there you yeah. guys did. And Carmine said to him, he goes, Well, why didn't you do it? He goes, I don't know. He's like, dude, you have somebody from vanilla fudge on it. Do your version of it. And he yep. goes, All right. And that's I'll- where he came. Cool. Thanks Love for it. bringing yeah, that story up. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Because and it's, it's a great a story. Psychedelic prog rock kind of music. Yeah. Um, and all these versions of it is great. Musically, vocally, when the song stops and he does that raspy, almost like, what was that? He did a song like that in the late 80s too. I forget what it was, but then he goes, and there ain't nothing I can do about it. And he just yeah. says that in that rod voice with yep. no music. Oh man, it just fucking works. It just works. At the 510 mark, Carmine a piece goes fucking nuts on the yep. drums and just he just loves awesome. drum fills. Nobody does a fill like Carmine. Oh, you know, yep. there's there's no you said it earlier, Tom. It's not a nope. fill he don't like. That's I'm right. Just trying to think what was that song? It wasn't infatuation. There God, was another no. It couldn't was have it been downtown that. train. Was it the it. Tom Waits song? Was it? Yeah, down, no, down, down, no, yeah. It, was, it wasn't that. It was um, not downtown train. Crazy about her. That's what it was. Ah. And the music would stop, and he'd say something, and he'd, and he'd whisper the lyrics to the song, and then and then the music would start again. I don't know that song. Oh yeah, if you heard it, you would know. It's like a late eighty okay. song. It was a hit on. It was on MTV a lot. But anyways, okay. um, this song was uh the technically the fourth single. But they only released it in Japan. Maybe it's a Carmine thing there or something. He's big. And wow, that's like a fuck. six or seven minute song. Yeah. I don't know how it worked. But regardless, another great track. Let's go to the next song. So now we're really getting into ballad country here. Because now we're doing If Loving You Is Wrong, I Don't Want To Be Right. All right, Tom. What does that remind you of it's immediately from? Was oh, Eddie Mur- Eddie Murphy. <laughs> it's from Coming to America. Yes. I love the <laughs> Lord. And loving, and loving you, right? I didn't want to be wrong because yep. he helped. Who did he help? He helped Daniel, you know, <laughs> to the, fight the battle yeah. of Jericho. He he helped, get, oh, no, he helped. Yeah, he helped yeah. Daniel fight the battle of Jericho or, or Daniel get out of the lion's den. Get out the lion's den. And somebody yeah. at the battle of Jericho. Yeah. And then what? what was he, the last then he, one? he helped Gilligan get off the <laughs> island. <laughs> I'm but, sorry, 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 this James. Is this is James what we do, James. is like, what the fuck are these no, guys talking about? No, he knows. Because I listen to you guys and to and, see you do it and now live you get to right see in front it. of me. I was just going to say, now you get to see it. So now yeah. you know that, that this is not premeditated. We don't have written oh, lines. There's now. no script it's, here. That's why I listen every organic. week. Yes. Thank you. We love that. We love that. The but, Lord. But, but yeah, this song is uh, just, this song is just not good. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna. That's my hot take. I'm sorry. I don't know what you guys think yet. I don't. I know it's a cover, and I know the cover was very popular. It it topped the R and B charts. Luther Ingram had the big one. Uh, for some reason, Barbara Mandrell felt that this needed to be covered by her. Um, the Mandrell sisters. It, it's it. It is. It, <laughs> when I listen to this, I'm like, this is the most hysterical <laughs> beating on your spouse <laughs> song. Ever re- like, and it's th- there's nothing to like decode here in the. Li- this is yeah, point no. blank. Like I know I got a wife and kids at home, but I want to. I can't. <laughs> I, can't I, I I need you, baby. It, uh, again, Rod's vocals can can kind of keep it afloat, but to me, it's just I, I don't like the song itself, and I just don't think well, there's only eight songs on this album. This is one of them. It it just it just didn't work for me. Um. Yeah. I I can't put that any better. Uh. This oh, is not okay. a good song. <laughs> it's 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 just it's despicable lyrically. It is. I, I it's mean, really bad. It's just bad. You, there's nothing worse when you when you're listening to a song, unless it's a character song like Alice Cooper, or Gene's doing the demon thing. But yeah. If it's it, you know, throughout this whole album, Rod is being very. Like I said, he's being very uh, communicative. He's being very uh, he, he autobiographical. He's spreading. He's talking about his childhood and his relationship with his parents and his sexual hangups and all these things. And so it's the singer songwriter thing that you brought up earlier. Yeah. So you tend to connect with that. And then this song, it just falls flat. It's just not a very good song. He does the bet. You said it perfectly. He does the best he can with it. But I think the, the I have to say, Tom, you win for the best backhanded compliment of any of all time is there's eight songs. There's eight songs on this album 
and this is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of reminds me, James, I, li- I listen to a lot of movie podcasts and sometimes the hosts will be like, yep. Okay. So this is a movie. It has actors. It's got a script <laughs> and it's a movie. And That's like the only thing that makes it a movie. It. Yeah. And they right, filmed right, it. right. 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 And they filmed it. And they filmed, <laughs> they put it on film. Have you ever yeah. just really quick? Go ahead. Have you ever watched a film like a really big budget blockbuster film? The, 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 the biggie is the Flintstones, right? From, from oh, years ago, God, it had yes. 25 different writers. And you're thinking to yourself, my God, how many homeless people could they have clothed and fed? <laughs> they could that, forget about uh, uh, we are the world. They could have fed with the millions and millions of dollars. They spent it. it. It just makes me sad when I see things like that. It's just like a, a complete waste of money. First of all, I love the fact that of all the movies you referenced, the Flintstones, which was the most unnecessarily live action movie ever made. Yeah, yeah, that's always pointed to as like the one that would have like twenty writers. That's yeah. why I love that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, that, I think the song they, is just not good. Yeah. They did a movie on the emojis. Yeah, but so at least that was animated and it was geared towards like, kids. But like, do you know what I mean? Like, I know they did the raisins. The California Raisins? Yeah, yeah. They, anything that's popular for five seconds. Didn't they do a movie of the cavemen from Geico? Yes. Yeah. Or no, a TV oh, show. Oh, TV, a TV show. TV no, show. We, even worse, they tried to make a TV show out of that. Yes. Oh, my wow. God. Oof. All right. If love me was wrong, I want to be right. <laughs> Written by Carl Hampton, Raymond Jackson, and Homer Banks. Might as well have been Homer Simpson. I, I don't... I, it's a... R and B, ooh, Teddy ooh. Pendergrass song or something. Yeah, I don't yeah, but know. It's, but it's not though. The lyrics are horrible. Yeah, it's, it's not a horrible love song. The guy's it's not, it's cheating. Not a, no, I know, he's but like, it's not like he's a battling his song. he's battling his demons, his inner demon, telling him this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. But ooh, come here, baby. Like he can't <laughs> help himself. I oh, know. I get it. I get it. There's so many and songs like this, but this one just is way too close the to the rod point. is just. Two went to the soulful Motown. Look, yeah. Let me see if I can pull this off. You, vocally, you might be able to. Okay, you yeah, sing this, but it's just yeah. But just because you can do it doesn't mean it should be done. And it's a bridge so, too far. It's a bridge yeah. too far for him. He, 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 but he, again, he, he, when I put this album on, I don't like immediately fast forward. It's not terrible. It no, just because, doesn't no, do anything be, because me. you want you you still enjoy his vocals. Yeah, because it doesn't. Yeah. It just doesn't do anything for me. So. Right. Anyways, let's see if the next track changes things. You got a nerve. Well, Rod, you got a nerve putting this song right <laughs> after the last song. Because for fuck's sake, we talk about track sequencing a lot on these. Again, eight songs, Rod. This is one of them. You break out this sitar. <laughs> ding, 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 and put ding, me ding. to sleep. Uh... Come on, man. You. you you started out so high on the mountain on this album. And as I'm listening to it, I'm like, God, I can't believe critics don't like this album. Then I make it to this part. I'm like, oh, this is why critics don't like this album. I don't think they're talking about this shit, though. No, I know. I know. I'm I just, think they're talking about the, the ballads. And no, I get I get it. Yeah. I, I just think I'll give him a little bit of credit. And I mean this like sincerely. I'm not trying to make up something to give him credit. Musically, it is, it's a, for lack of a better word, I guess maybe it's kind of like, it's adventurous, it's creative, it's, you know, it's got the Middle Eastern sound, the European sound, it's definitely unique, it, it's not something you would expect to hear from Rod. Again, his vocals make it tolerable, you know, because I love listening to his, his, him sing. It's just not a song that I would repeatedly go to on this album. This is a, this is, this is the transition. <laughs> yeah. You're going to get a lot of this for the next 10 years on Rod Stewart albums. It's just the, yeah. he, this is the mail it in that he gets shit for. And I agree with Zeus. This is not why he was lambasted. I already gave you my theories and I think they're fairly sound, uh, that this was during punk, especially in England. No one wanted to hear this bloated rock star, rich guy with his private planes and his model girlfriends who look like him <laughs> living in LA. I mean, the backlash from among, you know, writers like Lester Bangs and Dave Marsh was fierce because mm-hmm. people loved those early Rod Stewart records. And I think that they often blamed him for breaking up the faces and being a solo guy and being full of himself, which is bullshit. But this is, this is the kind of mail it in quasi rock, not really a genre 
that again, like you said about the last song, it's Rod Stewart. He's singing well. He's doing the best he can with this, but mm-hmm. it just doesn't seem like a great amount of effort was put together for this particular song. It's the weakest rocker on the on the. Um, it's a rocker, right? It's like you would call it that. I mean, because it's I'm on the side with all ballads, even though that one is kind of psychedelic. But that when he, you know when he sings, he's singing the the uh, Supreme song very mellow and everything like this. This is this is kind of lost also, as you mentioned, track listing. It's kind of lost in the second side. I, I yep. think it's kind of weak. So again, this is the precursor of like we are at the edge of Rod Stewart changing from that bluesy, boozy faces guy, you know, rocking country into this whole other world he's going to go into it. Do you think he's sexy and everything going forward? Whether people like it or not, he is changing and he doesn't give a shit. But I think this, this song is weak is what I'm saying there. Mm -hmm. Yep. You got a nerve written by Rod Stewart and Gary Granger. I was probably more aligned similar to you guys. And then when I did my research and I read the lyrics and I read the background, Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. I, um, the the song, the background is it's supposedly again Britt Eklund that she went on vacation something with somebody else or something like that and then she came back to him and he's like fuck off and he started doing his own thing I mean it's kind of, if you read the lyrics it's a kiss off type of song like fuck off and oh, yeah. I like it with the kind of spooky guitars and that eerie kind of sound almost a little Zeppelin-ish Battle mm-hmm. of fucking Evermore, ding, 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 like that kind yep. of mandolin shit. But you've got a nerve to come around here after all you've said and done. I thought I've seen everything. Obviously, I was wrong. I mean, there's a lot of shit. Like, yeah, you did all this stuff and stuff, and now you're coming back, pleading with me to take you back, teasing me with your charms. I, yep. If, when I read the lyrics and listened to the song, it grew on me. Um, I'm not saying it's hot legs, but it actually kind of it it it, it had an effect that I I wasn't expecting because I was like Good. you guys in the beginning, like ah. just to yeah, you know, just to back up what Zeus is saying, you know, it still hits that idiom that he built, which is the victim rod. Yeah, yeah. you know, he's he's it's a, yeah, it's a done me wrong song. Yeah, uh, and it's almost as if the guy from the last song is getting his comeuppance, you know, in a weird yeah. way. So if we want to go with that, Good point. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, last one, I'll leave you with this great lyric. You were my life, you were my breath, you were made every move I made. But recently, my opinions changed. The joke's on you, I'm afraid. Like, to me, that's like, oh, fuck yourself now. Yeah, fuck totally, off. Totally. And and so you got all sorts of like, ooh, what are you doing to me? You're seducing me to, ooh, I'm cheating on my wife with you. To, oh, you bitch, get out of here. I'm out, yep. you know, I'm all done with it. He's all over the map. But it's all about like bad relationship as, as they're a lot like kiss. Like, have you ever met any women in kiss songs? That's like likable. They're all well, the femme, assholes the or fe- bitches yes. or the femme fatale. Or- right. The femme fatale. That's dangerous to the oral rock star. Yeah. Uh, you know, is it, she's going to eat me up, spit me out, strutter. Yep. All that stuff is just, you know, and then do my drummer and then, you know, they come <laughs> calling back to me. Right. Right. But yep. interesting shit. Anyway, let's finish the album. So we finish up with I Was Only Joking. <clears throat> okay. I think this is a great way to end the album. Love the harmonies. Love the melody. Love how the song builds. Each instrument gets slowly added to the song. You got a great chorus. After that, the drums kick in, the full band. I think it's a great song. It's got a solo that is killer that kind of surprises you with the way the song is. I was like, what the fuck? How did, where did this come from? My only complaint, I just, I think those backing vocals are a little corny. I just, I just, it, maybe, I, 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 and I don't know if it's the backing vocals themselves that are corny or if it's the tone of them that make it. It's like, my, my dear. My, it's yeah, like it's yeah. almost like a like a barbershop quartet like jumping in and doing the backing vocals that's the only thing that kind of like honestly i'm listening to the song I'm like i really this is i like where this is going i like how this is building i think i like the lyrics the, kind of the story he's telling it's kind of like i don't i really really this this song 
connected to me probably it's not my favorite song on the album but i really really felt something hearing the song and i really really liked it i love what the band was doing and i'll uh, just i'll say it again that solo came out of nowhere like I, I was not expecting that and it's fucking blistering it's great but i really think this is a great way to end the album and i'm interested james in your thoughts because you said earlier how the first song and the last song kind of are is the bread to the sandwich so i'm anxious to see where you go with this this is one of the greatest songs that Rod Stewart has ever written. Ooh, all right. It wow. is absolutely gorgeous. It's yeah. a beautiful, beautiful melody. It's a wonderful sentiment. Everything that Loving You is wrong <laughs> is not in this song. It's just so autobiographical, yep. so intimate, it's so personal. And it absolutely is his final kiss off to that young, gruffy, ballsy guy who had to make it in one of the toughest, com- most competitive parts of English rock music ever. And he made it. And now he's a big star and he's, he's not apologizing for it. He's happy to have survived all that. But he's also saying, you know, that guy is saying hot legs and stay with me and kick you out. He's just this braggadocio guy. Cause I really deep down, I'm just. I'm just trying to get along. I, I'm just that same kid. Yeah. And to say I'm only joking and the beautiful way the song ends mm-hmm. with, with him just almost speaking that I'm, li- the, I have to leave the stage. He's again taking off the mask and saying that I've been wearing this mask and I'm going to take it off now and I'm going to be a whole other person again to, to his transition record. So yes. And the guitar solo, which is two different guitar solos. It's like this beautiful one. And then when it soars, it's 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 almost like I don't know if this is true, Zeus, and you'll read the the credits. I don't know if there's two different guitar players playing two different solos here. It's because Jim Cregan, it's Jim Cregan the whole way, the whole way. It's just I, so- I looked it up because because I was just like when I same thing with you guys. I'm like, what the fuck is it? And then I started hearing all the praises. I didn't realize how big and legendary this solo is. It's yeah. so cute. It's so beautiful. It's I, awesome. I, I I think it's one of. I think it's one of his greatest. It's my favorite. I must admit, if I could strip away everything that's even on, you know, Maggie May and all these other songs, I just when I I love this song so much. Mm. And when when you asked about talking about this record, this is what put me over the top. Remember when you asked me years ago, why did you write the Kiss book? Detroit Detroit Rock City is why I wrote that book. Nice because that song stayed with me all the years that I got out of Kiss and I didn't. I would go to these symposiums and talk to other music writers. I'm like, what? What about Detroit Rock City? That's the one of the best '70s rock songs. This song is is just so beautiful. I I, yeah. I, I I'm moved every time I hear it. I just love it, love sure. it, and a great way, as you said, Tom, to end this record, especially when if you consider my point about mm-hmm. it being sort of a historical arc of Rod Stewart's career up until that point. Perfect. So, um, I was only joking written by Rod Stewart and Gary Granger. So Gary Granger is writing all these songs with Rod Stewart. Bill Peake is doing the incredible solo and riffs on Hot Legs, and then Jim Cregan is doing this solo. That's fucking insane. And he's got three of them in his band. This was the third single. It made it to number twenty-two in the U.S., five in the U.K. Beautiful acoustic guitar melody. The song just tugs at you by its very sentimental Mm -hmm. lyrics and the way he's singing it, talking about his young friends and his dad and just it. I love things that remind me of my youth in the Mm seventies. Motown does. Kiss does. Rod Stewart does stuff that remind me when all the people in my life were alive. My grandparents, Going in Central Square, Cambridge, my my family, aunts, uncles, everybody's healthy, everybody's alive. I was a kid. I had no problems. I didn't have a math exam due next week. I didn't have to get something done for a client. I didn't have Tom saying, hey, what are we going to do next week? I don't know. What are you going to do? <laughs> um, yep. Like, life was this perfect time back then. Meanwhile, in reality, nothing's perfect. But that's where this song moves me. It puts me in that spot. It's nostalgic, and it's so Beyond belief. It's yep. so self-effacing. He is just totally stripping himself bare, bare here, which is completely opposite to the, to the record cover, to all the shit that goes on before it. It's just, it's one of the greatest endings of any album. It's just so him. And I, I love that you feel this way about it because for me, I always try to, 
give something that if some people don't hear some, I know not everyone's going to like this, but there'll be somebody that listens to the song that never heard this before and be like, holy fuck, or listens to this solo and starts looking into it and like, holy shit, what a guitar. And so you can find live concerts because Rod is all over YouTube. You can see all his concerts, all his videos, all live performances. And there's times where he has Jim Cregan back in his band lately. And he and Rod will say, like, and he looks back and there are these videos I've seen on YouTube, live performing. Rod will stand back with his arms folded with a big smile on his face, being like, look at this guy go. Look at that. This is a guy who sang my- with Jeff Beck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. So there's all you need to know just, about that. Just like admiring this beautiful piece of music. And for me, this is just emblematic of the 70s Rod. The great part of Rod Stewart in the 70s, there it is. And I hope that people hear this and, and feel what James is feeling. Because when I bought this album, I didn't know this song. It sounded familiar, but mm-hmm. I didn't know how great it was. And now it's to me, it's like... Yeah, yeah. Oh, because I, I mean, we didn't grow up. Rod was before our time. Right. So to me, now I realize how big of a song it is in his catalog yep. and then how legendary the guitar solo is on this. But I, I just hope people, uh, it, it, it hits somebody and somebody enjoys it for what it is. Yeah. So it's, it's like those verse melodies remind me so much of great musicals I liked when I was a kid. When I was a kid, we used to, my parents used to always take me to see Oliver when that came out in 68. Oh, because God, there were no yeah. movies you could see. And, 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 or Mary Poppins. Seeing mm-hmm. Mary Poppins with my dad, those melodies are just so beautiful. That's where my, th- th- those, and I'm giving the greatest compliment I could give besides maybe a Paul McCartney melody again. Those verse melodies are just absolutely pristine. They're they just, are. So it's, I agree. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that is Rod Stewart's, uh, Footloose and fancy free. So final thoughts. I'll I'll just go uh pass it around first. Uh Tom, then James, then I'll go. Yeah. So as I said earlier, I had never owned a Rod Stewart album and I had never owned this one. The only thing I knew off of this was Hot Legs. Um, I I like Rod Stewart. So this was a revelation to me. We just went through the tracks. Some of these songs I think are stone cold classics in very repeatable listens for sure. Some of them are not great, but Rod is great, so he can he can turn anything and make it listenable. Um so you know, I, I'm gonna give thanks to Zeus for pulling an album out that I had never heard of and opening up my eyes and ears to something new, and now I get some new favorite songs to put on shuffle, put on a playlist. So um yeah, I don't know where it's going to get ranked. You know, it's a short album. It's only eight songs, and not all of them are bangers for me. But uh, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed the album. Definitely enjoyed it. I'm so glad that that, that was what I was looking forward to. Uh, besides talking about it, I was I was Zeus and I talked about this as he mentioned earlier, uh, and he had offered another record, and I said, "Oh, I can give you more on that record because I saw the band play during that tour it and everything, and I love it more than this record." But there's something about this album. I think I used the word, um, I, I, I don't remember what word I used to describe it, but there's something, I had a, an adoration for it. It's just, it's just so sweet and it just works for me. Mm-hmm. And it's been great talking about it because it's not one I listen to all the time. I had to crack it back out, but I was, I just wanted to finish that thought about you, Tom, because I thought, I don't know what Tom's going to think. Yeah. I have no idea. Like you, yep. you might be like, this is insane. Why are we doing this? Yeah. No, I would never say that, but yeah. Because I know you're like, you know, you're into grunge and, and harder rock, and this this is definitely outside your normal, I'm assuming, listening. Tom to listens to Barry Manilow. No, actually, James. Tom it, listens to Barry Manilow. He's a fan of low? But <laughs> Yo, I, I love Barry Manilow. So I know that it wouldn't be but, out of his range. Well, he he would like it, he might not. It, but, and, and John, when he mentioned, but before I got on this podcast, yeah. I did not, because I, I knew it was coming from Zeus, so I assume he had some kind of nostalgic connection to this. But I but did, I, love, I was I, I didn't I, know what I, I was love, going to expect from Yeah, him. no, I, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, I love Elton John is one of my all-time favorites. I mean, I listen to Frank Sinatra. I love Steely Dan. I love Easy Listening. I love Yacht Rock. I love singer-songwriter stuff. But for some reason, Rod Stewart, just other than the hits, just never entered into my my catalog. I didn't grow up with it in my house. So it's, I didn't avoid him. He just never came to me. And now, Tom, you know, I was the same way. I was the yeah, same way, right? Yeah. So, uh, but then I bought this specific album. And so what I say to you, James, is I know you might like other albums. To me, what stood out for me is this was that band. Yes. yes. And, and this band 
is a revelation to, I think, to, uh, I think to Tom, at least, and maybe a lot of other people like, God damn, who the fuck is this? Why did yep. they, where did this band come from? And, and it's that you. good. And you it's just, interesting. Yes. You just reminded me, I, another shout out to my, my brother-in-law, Don. We were listening to this a couple of weeks ago when I told him I was going to do this with you guys. And he's, this is his favorite Rod Stewart album. So we were listening to it together and just, you know, remembering why we really love the record. So thank you both for having me on to talk about it because I, I got a renewed interest in it again. Yep. And even the ones we didn't even like, it was nice hearing them again. And just like Zeus said, it just took me back to another time. It really yeah. is. And, it, and, and, and I'll just finish this thought here. Sometimes when we do ARC, some of the some of our best or I'll, I'll speak for myself. Some of my favorite episodes are albums that aren't well known. You know, I mean, we did like last week we did Black Album. You know, we've done Pyromania and Appetite for Destruction and Highway to Hell and stuff. But sometimes when we pick albums that not everybody knows, I, sometimes those are even more enjoyable. You know, because you kind of you're talking to somebody that isn't familiar with it. You know, right. and and I think this is a good example of that. Yeah, true. And what what Tom had said early, like I I had no idea. To me, that's why this show, this sidecast, as we call it, is so much fun for me. Yeah, putting an album on his radar, or he does it to me. Yep, I love that that's conversation. Great. That's and great. that's what yeah. makes it fun. So, yeah, this is a blast, all right, dude. let's go to rankings. That's what we're doing next. Yeah. So why don't we go, Tom, James, and then I'll go last. If that's okay with you guys. All right. Sure. Okay. All right. So number eight for me is you got a nerve. Okay. Yeah. Same. You got same. You got a nerve. Yep. Okay. Really? Yep. Wow. Um, I'm going to go with if, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Oh, well, that's my number seven. Uh oh. S- same here. Yeah. Well, I don't think, I Look mean, there's only. I mean, there's only eight songs, and we know which ones are the good ones. So. Yeah, and we well, yeah. If anybody listened to the earlier part, we knew it was something was going to be seven and eight, and these yeah. two, you could flip flop yeah. them both. Uh, I only, I think, again, you got a nerve is more of a mail in song, as I said earlier. Where if loving you is wrong, it really wasn't Rod Stewart's fault. He, he chose the song. I know he did the yeah. best he could with it, so I don't put it last. I put it next to last. Okay, Zeus, seven for you. All right, so for me, I'm going to go with in a song that I like. You got a nerve. Okay. Um. Th- now that now this is top. I mean, I I have my top two, but these next few songs could kind of be thrown in whatever order. But depending on my mood, and right now my mood is for number six. I have you keep me hanging on, and Ooh. I love it. But I I love it. But there's songs I like more. That's my number six. Yeah, I thought maybe you'd go that way the way you were talking about it. Yeah. Um. Just want to say what a blast it is. Hey, everybody who listens to Tom and Zeus and you listen to Shout Out Loud and everything like that, to be able to sit here and do a, t- a ranking with these two guys <laughs> after all the rankings I've heard, it's really kind of a blast. Oh, I thanks, man. You. Appreciate that I, so much. I, I love it. I love that uh, I'm doing this with you guys. Okay, that, so my number, what are we up to? Number seven? Six. six. Oh, six. Right. Um, number six for me is You're Insane. Whoa. Okay. Not to, you're not into, not into the funk rod. Okay. I, I like, but by the way, I l- really like this song a lot. But as yeah. you said, there's eight, so you got to yeah. put them somewhere. And I just like the the, the top five better. Okay, yeah. Zeus. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, I want you're insane next. Okay, uh, number five for me is you're in my heart. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah I know. I, I, it's a great song, but James, what do you got for five? I think I'm, I know where where Tom's going. Oh, uh, yeah. Number five for me is Born Loose. I think it's the uh, like I said, it arguably the best um rocker on here but i think you guys know where i'm going for the the best rocker on here but it's number right there i'm sorry <laughs> number five james god damn you all right it's okay this is why i love rankings i just love yelling at people i know i like um, being part of this yeah james i'm going with you born loose. oh my god what's the matter with the two of you <laughs> god I thought Tom Ugh. and I were simpatico. Now Zeus has come on board. I God. like it. But you can remember this. I like, it's like when you guys say we're ranking these, but we love every Kiss song. Yeah, and it's exactly. Hard. Yeah. Yep. But we don't love every song on this record. But no, I know. It's okay. It's forced okay. to make the rank. It's really hard. It's okay. Uh, number four for me is You're Insane. All James. Right. Number four for me is, uh, yeah, You Keep Me Hanging On is number four for me. Okay. That's the same for me. Oh, you guys get a room. <laughs> 
Well, you know where I'm going with this. And I'm, I know. I'm, I'm I know, going I know, rogue I know, here. I know. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. All right. Uh, number three for me, this will probably get a lot of groans from you guys in the audience. Number three for me is hot legs. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. Now, just so you know, right before when I was doing this earlier today, right before we did this, uh, Zeus is like, hey, we're going to be doing this soon. I flip flopped these. So you keep me hanging on was number three. Okay. But I flip flopped it. And I think you're in my heart is number number three. three. Okay. Gotcha. All right. For number three nostalgic. for me, uh, we're almost there, but I went, I was only joking is number three. Okay. Uh, that is actually my number two. I was only joking. I love, I think it's a great song. Love it. That's my wow, I'm glad they've made up there for you guys. Yeah. My number two is hot legs. Nice. You know where I was going. I mean, you're, only I joking. know, I know it's okay. Yep. Zeus. Yeah. You're in my heart. Number two. Okay. Nice. Number one, easily. Um, uh, uh, it's got to be the rock song on the album here. That's full of soft rock and ballads. Born loose. I think the song absolutely rips. I fucking love it. I love it. It's, it like, I think it's, it's like the best song. The stones never recorded. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I think it's great. And James, you're number one. I love it. Go ahead. Yeah, I was only joking. I, you know, I think I gave away the ghost before. Uh, yep. One of my favorite, if not my favorite ballads, of Rod Stewart's. I love everything about it. The lyrics, yep. the melodies, just beautiful. Good stuff. And Zeus, go ahead. Uh, there's nothing. This might be, uh, we might have to ring the bell for number one of all time. What? Hot, hot Legs is number one. Wow. Without even close wow. to anything. That's great. It's great. It it's is definitely great. And I love You're In My Heart, but Hot Legs with a bullet, with every else description on it is number one for me. It is the funnest, coolest fucking song and rod kills it and the band kills it i just love it and, hence, and they, that's why we're doing this they yep. could have easily I, I, I failed to mention this before but they could have easily faded that out but they he, the, the way they end that yeah way, it's a little oh, bit yeah. at the end yeah, yeah at the end he you know being pussy whipped and shit and that's still cool that. though they do it cold I love yeah a good cold ending it has to be cold yeah. if they're going to be doing that sloppy you know in garage band shit <laughs> that's right but that, yes but that that video puts it way over the top for me just yep. legendary so james we're going to our favorite part tom loves this that's this so james what makes you rock hard well, <laughs> we love, we, we, I mean, where else? What other show can you go on where people are going to ask you that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm afraid if I say anything on this for this answer, it's going to be wrong. No, it can, well, anything. don't say like underage uh, teenage uh, girl. Yeah, don't long. don't. No, yeah, don't say I, like what? That. I'm not going to say <laughs> this. Is, this is, <laughs> keep it, keep it clean, James. Come on. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. You know the kind of ship we run. I, I will say. You know, one of the things that has been a real great uh, aspect of this summer for uh, my family and I mm -hmm. is we've been doing a lot of traveling. And I know Good. it's been a slow comeback from COVID. We traveled even we left the country like lunatics during the COVID era, era 21, 22. We had to get tests just to get back in the country. And it's just so nice to be able to travel now. Went to Europe with my family. My daughter had never been to London or Paris. Oh, we nice. went there together. Went to Costa Rica this year for my daughter's 16th um, birthday because she's a cool kid. She didn't want a big party. She wanted to go see animals in the wild. So that was that's cool. Wild. Oh, that's awesome. It's just been a good summer and spring good. and summer for that. So, yeah, that's that's probably way too clean an answer for this. No, not at all. You know, it, it can be any, anything that that you're excited about, that you're thinking about. Summer enjoying. travels. Yeah, absolutely. It's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Right. Perfect. Tom? Yeah. Yeah, mine is not as happy as as yours, James. But mine is something I discovered on Netflix. Um, I love documentaries, uh, and I love when I discover a documentary about something that I'm not familiar with. So obviously, there's documentaries out, out there about everything, and some of the stuff we see in here on a daily basis. But I like when I find ones that I know nothing about, and I found one. It's called Buried, and it's about an incident from 1982. At the Alpine Meadows Ski Resort in Lake Tahoe, and there was an avalanche. And they interview all the people. So this this ski resort had an actual ski patrol. And pretty much everybody uh, involved in it back in the 80s, that ski patrol team, they're all still alive and doing interviews. And they recount everything that led up to the avalanche, everything the aftermath of it. 
And it's really fascinating, too, because I'm terrified of, like, natural disasters, and I'm also obsessed with, like, the weather. So this kind of checked off both boxes for me. Like, <laughs> the, these guys were talking about, like, the science of avalanches, like, what causes them, how to prevent them, how to watch out for them, what to do after. Like, it was just really, really fascinating. And now, all that being said, it's a difficult watch. It was a it was a tragedy. Um but it's super well made. It's it's not a series. It's just one one off. I think it's about maybe not even a, not even an hour and a half. But it's really really well made. Um, and it's just it's just a fascinating thing that you don't hear about. You don't really hear about avalanches. You know, you hear about maybe tornadoes and hurricanes and things like oh. that. But this is really fascinating. It's called Buried, and it's on Netflix. So if you if you're into that kind of thing, but I would just give you a fair warning that it does have some difficult parts. But it's it's really it's really uh, informative, and I, I enjoyed it. So thanks. I'm on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Zeus. All right. So Tom, for me, um, I, I don't know if, if this is considered a horror film. Uh, I guess it can be. But if you as you know, if you're on Facebook now, there's always like little clips that come on. And then yeah. you can go down that rabbit hole that it's almost like uh YouTube. You start going to this clip and you see this clip. So lately the Brady Bunch clips come up, and I'm and I find myself looking at Brady Bunch clips and go, I remember that scene. I yep. remember this. It's, I always like fascinating to to watch Mike Brady to oh, see God. just to focus on his parental like attitude and stuff. It's funny shit. But regardless, <laughs> I saw a clip of in lots of time. There's these movies and they'll put a clip up, and and then nobody ever says what the fucking movie is under the comments. And yeah, then yeah. you finally find one. I'm like, well, I saw a clip of this like scary scene of a diner. And this old lady asking for something. And then she turns into like a fucking monster. It's not attacking everybody. And it's a movie from 2010. It's called Legion. I'm sure you've seen oh, it. Oh, I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Yep. Oh, you haven't yep. seen it. I have oh, not wow. seen it. I've not seen it, but I've heard of it. Yes. Legion. So it stars uh, Paul Bettany. I'm yep. sure you know him. Tyrese oh, yeah. is in it. Kate Walsh, yep. Dennis Quaid, and a bunch of others. Yep. Um, And it's like apocalyptic stuff. Yeah, the end of the world is coming, and people in this diner they're going after some lady who has a who's pregnant, who's if baby survives, humanity lives on. So then the angels are Archangel Michael comes, and is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? And there's fucking just people getting ripped to shreds and all sorts of. It's pretty good. I got hooked just from that one scene I saw on Facebook. I watched the movie. I really enjoyed it. And I like those biblical, like horror drama movies, like the seventh sign and all well, that. I was going to say, any, anytime you see anything with Legion in it, it's going to be biblical. It's going to be involved in the yeah, angels. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. I guess the movie did pretty good. I don't yep. know, but I liked it. I thought it was a cool movie and, and, and it kind of falls into that horror genre, which you like. Oh, yeah, totally. So I yeah. I'd mention yeah. that one. So Is it streaming? Legion. Is that streaming? I found it on streaming. Yeah, somewhere for free. Yep. Oh, okay. What's yeah, I was the app, say- Tom, that you showed me? That I it's, like now it, it's you- it, it's called Just Watch. It's an app, and it, you type in any movie, and it'll tell you where it's streaming. Oh, cool. So, Le- so Legion right now is available on Hulu. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. So it was yeah. really good. I I mean, I find those things fascinating. Anyways, um, I did want to. I did want to, if I may, have a second turn at this because you guys yeah, mentioned right both in. artistic, both creative things. Real quick. So Pete Townsend. Uh, put out a series of live records. I have a few of them over the years. He compiled them into a box set thing. Yep. And from like, from, you know, the, the seventies all the way through the early aughts. And one of the cool things about it is his full Lifehouse show from the oh. early aughts. And I had, I bought the Lifehouse box set. Lifehouse has been one of my great obsessions. I always was, was I'm a huge Townsend fan. And yeah. I, and I, th- I always broke my heart that he could never get that finished, you know, and yeah. those songs are peppered throughout, obviously who's next and other uh, records and singles. Uh, but he did the full thing and I bought the box set and it's got the lyrics, it's got a radio nice. brunch, but they put the live show as one of the last. And if anybody has a chance to listen to the life house live, do it. It's on Spotify. You can listen to the whole show. It's absolutely beautiful. And you'll recognize a lot of the songs, a lot of who's next songs on there, but it, and it just, he sounds so joyful singing it. So there you go. That I did. The only only issue I have with that, it sounds like just like what happened with Brian Wilson and smile. Yes. Where I know it's nice to hear these songs and nice to come out, but it's still Brian Wilson smile. It's not the beach boys in that period. releasing That photo. And that's how I look at this. It's not, Pete Townsend with the who behind him. 
putting these songs out. It's Pete Townsend, the solo artist, putting these songs right. out. Right. And, you know, it's interesting. When I interviewed Brian Wilson years ago, I asked him, do you prefer the smile? Because they came out with a box set, which I have yeah, as I well. Have it. Love smile. I have it. And it's yeah. beautiful. But he said, but of course he would. He said he liked his version better because that's what was going on in his head. He could yep. never, that's what drove him crazy. Mm-hmm. He could not get those sounds. But I'm with you, Zeus. I'd rather hear, it would have been nice to get the who to do it. But at I'm glad that Pete time. got him at All that right. time. But the poor guy at least got the work out. And I, yeah, and I, that's great. As a creative person, I I applaud that. Yes. And I I want to make one quick correction before we continue. I I, I misspoke. Legion is available on Amazon, not Hulu. Hulu has the TV series called Legion. There's a a TV show. They made a TV show on it? Wow. Yeah, the movie that Zeus is referring to is on Amazon. So good. I've got Amazon. I don't have Hulu, so I can watch it. There you go. There you go. Yep. Well, James, why don't you tell people where they can find you? Sure. Uh, you can find me on my website, jamescampion.com. It's sort of an archive for all my written work, music, other things. Uh, I, you can buy any of my books there. I will mail it to you free if you live in the continental U.S., and I will sign it to anyone, you, yourself, a friend, whatever. Um, and you can, of course, find my books anywhere in the world, wherever good books are sold. And also my contributions to the brand new Raise Your Glasses. You'll be able to find that out there. Uh, mm-hmm. We're recording this the day before it comes out. I'm very excited for you guys. Thank and you. that's thank and you, I'm you. at Fear No Art on Twitter, or what they call X now, I guess, and yep. at James Campion on Instagram. My author page just completely disappeared. This happened to Eddie Trunk. He and I were going back and forth. Like, if you have another page that controls the other pages and it has your name on it, and then I had an author page for like 10 years, and they just got rid of it. And my assistant tried oh. to get it back, and it, it's and I finally said, you know what, screw it, I, I, the hell with Facebook. I have Facebook pages for all my books, including Shout It Out Loud, and I'll do that for the Prince book. But as far as me having a presence on there, I'm kind of like, you know, right now, just kind of laying low. But that's how you can find me in the other social media places. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, James, we can't thank you enough. Appreciate you being here, buddy, and we can't wait to connect in person again and share a beer. Yeah, James, thank you guys. Thank James, you. James, thank you so much for joining us. This was a blast. We love hearing from you, talking to you. It was great to finally meet you, but just to spend some time on our show with you has just been a thrill. So we're so glad you were able to join us. We'll definitely all we'll d- definitely have you back. So thank, thank you so you. much, buddy. Yeah. Good luck. I had a I had a blast. Best of luck with the book, guys. Again, awesome. congratulations. Thank, thanks thank so you. much, James. All right, be good. We'll talk. Peace. All right, buddy. All right, Tom. So what we do next, we have a little work to do. We rank the album covers first against the previous albums we've done. So do you want to read your top five? Yep. My top five album covers are number five, Rage Against the Machine. Number four, Blizzard of Oz. Three is Purple Rain. Two is Master of Puppets. Number one is Diary of a Madman. Um, I like this album cover. I mean, I know it's just a close up of his mug. You know, it's nothing really you know, spectacular or, or crazy, but I just think it captures a vibe. It captures a moment in time. And I just think it's really cool. And I did liken it to hotel California. So I'm going to put it just below hotel California. I'm going to put it at number 30. Okay. All right. Number 30. Yep. All right, Tom, my top five peace of mind, diary of a madman. Number four, Three, Appetitti. Two, Blizzard of Oz. One, Hotel California. Um, I, you know, it's a good album cover. It's very nostalgic for me. Very 70s. I'm going to go higher, a little higher than that. I'm going to okay. go at number 16. And underneath okay. Purple and above Difficult to Cure. Okay. All right. Let's move over to album rankings. All right, my top five album rankings are number five, Journey Escape. Number four, Shout of the Devil, Motley Crue. Number three, Prince, Purple Rain. Two, Rush, Moving Pictures. And number one, Metallica, Puppets. We say this every week, or at least I do. It gets extremely hard. It continues to get very difficult yeah. to rank these because there's so much, di- so many different genres and styles. I like the album. It's only eight songs. Some of the songs are not great. Um, but like I did with the album cover. I'm going to put it right below Hotel California. I'm going to put it in 42. Okay. I like it, but again, it's short and that, I, that kind of gets a penalty for me. So it does like it. because it's short. Well, the, the re- really? I, 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 let me clarify. It gets penalized because it's short and some of the songs aren't good. So if you're going to have a short album, you better make sure that there are all bangers. That's my theory. Okay. Okay. 
Well, I will say the same thing, though. I say Zeppelin albums have eight songs, and not all of them are great. Right, which is why Zeppelin 4 stinks. <laughs> I still can't believe it. That's your theory. All right. Go ahead. Well, Tom, for me, uh, my top five, Pyromania is five. Four is Blizzard of Oz. Three, Hotel California. Two, Automatic for the People. One is Purple. Where am I going to put this album? I'm going to put this album just outside my top 10. Whoa. I'm putting this at 11. Damn, I'm bro. Underneath 10 and above who's next. Wow. Um, I, I love it. Even the worst song of this album, If Loving You, isn't that bad for me. Okay. But that fucking top three in Hot Legs, whoo, does it get bonuses for having one of my favorite songs of all time? Yeah. Um, that helps a lot. And I, it's just a nostalgic album to me. I, I fucking can't get enough of it. So uh, Footloose and Fancy Free is number 11 for me. And that's the Rod Stewart album, Tom. Nice. Nice. Tom, Love it. Why don't you tell people uh, where they can find us? Yeah, so if this is your first time hearing us, we are Shout Out Loudcast. We are an all-KISS podcast running KISS-related episodes every Saturday. We do these album review crew episodes once a month. And the best place you can find out about us and the show and everything else we do, including our brand new book, Raise Your Glasses, which is available. Go to our website. You'll see a link right on the landing page with all the details and the Amazon link to buy it. Shoutoutloudcast.com. That's where you can find out all about our show and the book and so much more. So please go there. And of course, please, we'd love to hear from you guys. Send us an email, shoutoutloudcast at gmail.com. Follow us on all the social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And we are a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network of Shows. Yeah, uh, Tom, uh, you you said it. Everywhere you, everything you want to find out about this album or previous album review crews uh, episodes, you go to the website. It has everything. Shout it out loudcast dot com, as Tom mentioned, and make sure you go out and get your copy of Raise Your Glasses, our new book, which is available now on Amazon. Or go to shout it out loudcast dot com. Click on the button right on the landing page. It'll bring you right there and order the book. You will not be sorry. Um, Tom, what we do before we sign off, we always end on famous last words. Do you have any? I do. Smile for the camera. Please mind your manner. You've got to keep your image clean. Clench your fist. Don't you take a piss. <laughs> Makes you want to slash your wrist. <laughs> You did, he say, did he say piss cup? <laughs> we talked about the piss cups in a while. Oh. Anyways, Tom, you've got a most persuasive tongue. You promise all kinds of fun. But what you don't understand, I'm a working man. James Campion, Tom, Loudcasts, Kiss Army, Rod Tards. Thank you. Guys, you're the best. Thank you so much. A massive shout out to James Campion. He was fantastic on this episode. What a thrill to have him here. Great stuff. Zeus, I am very grateful for you picking this album. I love learning about stuff that I don't know when it comes to music. Good pick. Very excited about it and love the episode. And and whose pick is it next month, Tom? Patreon. And we don't know what that's going to be yet. But Zeus, as always, my friend, thank you, Rod Tards. Peace out, Girl Scout.